Power BI is the market leader in solving data management crisis. This tool is mainly aimed to help organizations and individuals to visualize and organize their data. Hi everyone, I welcome you to this session on Power BI full course, which contains everything that you need to know in order to master Power BI. Now, before we move any further, let's take a look at the agenda for today. The first module, which is an introduction to Power BI, will help you understand the importance of BI, the different tools that are there and why you should go for Power BI. It also covers the basic fundamentals of Power BI. The second module, which is Power BI Desktop, here you'll learn how to install and download the tool and you'll also get familiar with the UI of the tool. The third module, which is Power BI Charts, will help you understand how to create impactful and comprehensive reports on the Power BI Desktop. The next module, which is Power BI KPI Indicators, will help you understand the importance of KPI visualization and how they can benefit an organization in visualizing their growth. The next module, which is Power BI Dashboards, will help you understand how to create interactive dashboards with the help of a lot of examples and use cases. Followed by this, we have a comparison module between Power BI and Tableau. In this module, you'll understand the important features of both of these powerful tools. Followed by this, we have the last module, which is Power BI Interview Questions. Here you'll understand the important concepts of Power BI and how you can ace a Power BI interview. We'll also look at a couple of market trends of Power BI. So guys, before we move any further, make sure you go ahead and subscribe to Edureka YouTube channel in order to stay updated about the most trending technologies. The concept of business intelligence is something that is alien to very few people these days. With newer tools emerging every day to help solve the crisis of data management, most organizations have already moved in or have plans to use business intelligence in solving their crisis. And in this module, we are going to talk all about Power BI. Power BI is Microsoft's latest BI tool mainly aimed to help everyone analyze and visualize their data. So without much ado, let's get started. Now, why should you choose Power BI? Before I answer this question, I would like to answer something a little more fundamental. Let's start by addressing the most essential and fundamental question. What exactly is business intelligence? Now, in an age where business intelligence has become a bigger domain than most trending technologies, if you ask 20 different people what the term means, you're likely to get at least 10 different answers. So let me try and put it in the simplest of terms without having to lose the technicality of it. Business intelligence is a set of techniques and tools for the transformation of your raw data, meaning your data sets, into meaningful and useful information to take important business decisions. To put it simply, business intelligence is the technology would get the right data to the right people at the right time so that they can take more effective business decisions. Over the years, the process of business intelligence has grown and adapted to help solve almost all the challenges while dealing with data by involving newer tools and techniques. The change that business intelligence has seen over years can be divided into three waves. So let us continue with our tutorial and take a look at the first wave, IT to end user or the technical wave. During the first wave of business intelligence, the end user had to be dependent on the IT department for data insights. This is because it was not possible for end users to create visualizations or reports on their own as tools available required some technical or coding knowledge. This dependence on the IT department for insights resulted in more efforts and time consumption to get the updates done. Now the second wave, which is analyst to end user or the self-service wave. Now the second wave gave analysts access to BI. Now people with some knowledge of analytics could use BI tools. This meant more teams had the access to BI and more people could have better data insights. This is the role of the IT teams. And finally, the third wave, which meant everyone, which means the power lied in the hands of the end user. The third wave made it easier to access data and create reports and visuals to get better business insights. 
the introduction of tools like Power BI, Tableau, ClickView, and Spotfire made this transition easy. Now, anybody who had a basic understanding of data could create reports to build intuitive and shareable dashboards. This was about the three waves of BI. And in the third view came a very important aspect data visualization. Now, data visualization is nothing but the pictorial or graphical representation of information or data. It provides insights into complex data sets by communicating the key aspects in a more intuitive and meaningful way. Data visualization lies at the intersection of design, communication, and information service. Even though your data visualization has been termed as the key skill for research in the 21st century, it goes way, way back. It existed in the late 18th century and can be traced back to when William Playfair invented the geometrical charts. His bar charts were used to represent Scotland's imports and exports of 17 countries in 1781. These bar charts constituted a pure solution to the problem of discrete quantitative comparison. Now, obviously, we have grown to learn about more and more charts as the years pass by. We also have a few hybrid charts to make our jobs easier and our calculations more granular. The way our human brain processes the information is easier to use images, charts, and graphs to understand and visualize large amounts of complex data than going through tons and tons of spreadsheets on reports. Take the quote, an image is worth a thousand words, for example. This is completely true because as a human mind, Images aren't just a mere collection of pixels. They hold a lot of information. This information in visual form is easy to understand than reading the same facts in text or number form. So let me give you an example. Suppose there's a company which deals with a lot of products like Amazon and it's widespread over the world and has many, many vendors that sell through this platform. So obviously, there's a lot of data being generated in a lot of different formats. People use Excel, Access, different databases, SQL Server, so on and so forth. Some people even make all these spreadsheets and upload it to the web. So obviously, all that has to be brought to a single platform to analyze. And then these are the reports that go to the CEOs, CFOs, and the CXO position, all the big people in Amazon. Now, you can't just take 1 million or 10 million rows of data to a person to look at and infer something, right? You need them to know what's going on. What is going on inside the company? How is the market outside of the company? And this cannot be done with hundreds and thousands of numbers. This is where data visualization comes into picture. It's about giving them an idea of what's going on inside their company in different departments without having to look at tons and tons of numbers. Well-designed graphics have the power to put this complicated data into simple pictures. And this is where modern BI wins. Data visualization is a quick and easy way to convey concepts or information in a universal manner. It can help to one, identify key areas and hidden patterns, two, get factors that give better customer insights, three, analyze and associate data and products properly, and finally, make proper predictions. And obviously, presentation has a big role to play in this. So pardon me for my analogy, but if this was a beauty contest, let's go ahead and look at our winner. Now let's see why we need Power BI. Now there are a few points that make Power BI one of the most prominent tools for data visualization. Now, this tutorial would be incomplete without understanding these points. Firstly, Power BI can spot trends in real time. Traditional BI tools like Tableau or ClickView restrict you to historical analysis. By using Power BI, you can access real time information so you can identify trends early. By doing so, you can identify issues and improve performance. Secondly, Power BI can automatically search hidden insights. With Power BI, you can auto search data sets for hidden insights in seconds with quick insights. Users can simply ask questions and Power BI Q&A will answer their questions with an immediate effect. 
third advanced analytics and custom visualizations with custom visuals power bi allows you to visualize data in almost every way possible as long as you can imagine it you can put it on your dashboard thus you're not limited to something that lies in a box finally power bi is enterprise ready with power bi and power bi desktop you can securely connect to your own on premises data sources with the on premises data gateway you can connect live to your sql server and other data sources it gives you a secure scalable and reliable enterprise grade information technology and these mentioned reasons make power bi very important in context of data visualization so who can use power bi it professionals developers companies big and small subject matter experts and plain analytics enthusiasts as long as you want to you can all use power bi continue to understand this by knowing what is power bi now power bi as a name has been in the bi market for quite a long time the microsoft team has worked for a long time to build a big umbrella called power bi and this umbrella is a combination of strong visualization data analysis data sharing aggregating and cloud integration to define it power bi is a business analytics service provided by microsoft It provides interactive visualization with self-service business intelligence capabilities where end users can create reports and dashboards by themselves without having to depend on information technology staff or database administrators. It also gives you cloud-based BI services known as Power BI services along with a desktop-based inference called Power BI Desktop. It offers data warehouse capabilities using data prep, data discovery, and interactive dashboards in march of 2016 microsoft released an additional service called power bi embedded on its azure cloud platform which enables the user to analyze data easily and perform various etl operations and deliver reports with power bi the power bi gateways let you connect with access excel SQL Server databases, analytics services, and many other sources to your dashboard in Power BI. And reporting portals embed Power BI reports and dashboards to give you a unified experience. What you see on your screens right now shows Power BI's general workflow. You have thousands of data sources which are being connected to Power BI Desktop, which then can be published into the service. and gives you an option of connecting your organizational data live through your power bi gateways in the end this can all be accessed through your tablets laptops and cell phones with you your colleagues and everybody involved in your business decision now that you understand what power bi is let's go ahead and look at a few of its benefits and why are we using this Firstly it has pre-built dashboards and reports for popular software as a service solutions. Power BI helps you create powerful visualizations in the form of dashboards and reports and you can do them without any technical knowledge at all. All you need to do is have a little bit of analytical sense and you can use this service to your advantage. Next it has real-time dashboard updates. As I had mentioned before, Power BI works real time and it can forecast trends in the coming few years as well. Third, secure live connection to your data sources on premises and in the cloud. Through the Power BI gateway, you can establish connections that are secure and your organizational data can be connected to live every time that you want to. The best part about this is it is scalable and very very secure. Fourth, Power BI also provides you intuitive data exploration using natural language query. You do not have to know the query language to explore your data in Power BI. Just using your everyday English or your natural language, data exploration can be made possible. Fifth, integration with familiar microsoft products to utilize commitment for scale power bi can integrate with a number of sources and a number of microsoft products which makes it highly scalable compared to other bi tools 
and finally immediate deployment power bi is known for its quick deployment which makes your job quick as well as easy when you have to take critical business decisions and that was all about power bi in the section ahead we are going to discuss a few components of power bi now power bi has a few components you have power query power pivot power view power map data catalog data management gateway power bi q and a and service starting up we have power query now this is a component which can be used to search and access and transform public and internal data sources it is the microsoft's data connectivity and data preparation technology which enables business users to seamlessly access data stored in hundreds of data sources and reshape it to fit their needs with an easy to use engaging and no code user experience next we have power pivot now you can use this for data modeling for in memory analytics it extends a local instance of microsoft analysis services tabular that is embedded directly into your workbook it enables you to import millions of rows of data from multiple data sources into a single power bi workbook it helps you create relationships between heterogeneous data create calculated columns and measures using formulas and build pivot tables and pivot charts and further analyze the data then you have power view which is a data visualization technology that lets you create interactive charts graphs maps and other visuals that bring your data to life now power view is available in power bi excel and other analysis services from microsoft then you have power map which is also another feature in excel it is for exploring map and time based data it lets you plot geographic and temporal data visually analyze that data in 3d and create cinematic tours to share with others next you have power bi services so this is a collection of apps dashboards and reports built to deliver key metrics for your organization these apps are interactive with each other and helps customers work with their own content then we have power bi q and a it's basically a feature which helps you ask questions and get immediate answers sometimes the fastest way to get an answer from your data is to ask the question using natural language so you can use q and a to explore your data using intuitive natural language capabilities and receive answers in the form of charts and graphs next you have the data management gateway so basically what this does is it connects your on premise servers with your power bi in the cloud if you want to refresh your data in the cloud with the data that is on the premise you will need to have the data management gateway configured and available to your tenant and that is how this works and finally we have our power bi data catalog now this contains the metadata for felicitated search functionality in power bi now your metadata gets stored in power bi data catalog in the cloud for a shared query it gives you a search access list for the query to determine which users and security groups can find and use this shared query now that we've seen how the components work let's continue with this tutorial and understand the architecture of power bi now broadly describing power bi's architecture has three phases the first two phases partially use etl to handle data and then you have the presentation of your data so let's take a look at these phases one by one first you have data integration an organization can be required to deal with data that comes in from different sources as i had earlier explained in my amazon example now this data comes from different sources and can be in different file formats now the data is first extracted from these sources which can be your different servers or databases so on and so forth from wherever you can pull in data this data is then integrated in a standard format and then stored at a common area called as a staging area then we go to our second step data processing now the integrated data is still not ready for visualization because the data needs processing before it can be presented now this data is pre-processed or cleaned as we can call it 
This is also known as transformation of data. For example, missing values or redundant values are removed from the data set. After the data set is cleaned, business rules are applied to the data and it is transformed into presentable data. Now this data is then loaded into a data warehouse. And now that you have extracted, transformed and loaded data, your ETL is complete. Finally, you have data presentation. So once all this data is loaded and transformed, it can be visualized much better with use of various visualizations that Power BI has to offer. You use reports, dashboards and help one represent data in a more intuitive manner. These visuals, reports help business end users take important business decisions based on these insights. With that, let's move on to the building blocks of Power BI, where we can talk a little more about these insights. Now, everything you do in Power BI can be broken down into the following building blocks. A good understanding of these building blocks would help you understand concepts and will let you create detailed and complex reports. So the basic building blocks of Power BI are the following. You have visualizations, data sets, reports, dashboards and tiles. First up, you have a visualization. A visual representation in the form of graphs and charts and maps of a data is called visualization. For example, a chart or a graph can be used to represent data visually. Power BI gives you different visualization types which keep getting updated with time. Now some of the commonly used visualizations are map representation, card visualization, stacked area chart, tree map and pie chart. Now these visualizations can be simple or complex. However, Visualizations aim at presenting data in such a way that it gives you more insight in the context, which is otherwise difficult to discern from simple data files. Next, we have data sets. Now we know that a data set is nothing but a collection of data or information in the form of spreadsheets. Now Power BI can harness this data to create visualizations. It can be a simple data set or a combination of many different sources which can be filtered and combined to provide a different data set altogether. For example, you can pull together data from many different sources like a different database fields, an Excel table, and online results of some email campaign to create your data set. Having said that, you may want to filter your data before you bring it into Power BI. Filtering lets you focus on the data that actually matters. With your data set ready, you are now free to create visualizations and display different portions of the data that set in different ways. And with this, you gain insights. Next, you have reports. Now, a collection of visualizations that appear together on one or more pages is a report in Power BI. In a collection of items, these reports combine to form a workbook and are all related to each other. You can create visualizations on multiple different pages if necessary and arrange them in a way that best suits your interest. What you see on your screen is the image of a sample report. Next, you have dashboards. Now, Power BI dashboard is a single page interface. It is often called a canvas that uses visualizations to tell a story. Now, a lot of you might be confused within the difference between a report and a dashboard. Now this is because it is limited to one page. A well-designed dashboard contains only the most important elements of your story or your report. The visualizations you see on your dashboard are called tiles and are pinned to the dashboard from the reports. So in a way, you can say that your dashboard is a compressed version of large reports that you are going to present. Now, because this is limited to just one page, a well-designed dashboard contains only the most important elements of that story. The visualizations you see on the dashboard are called tiles and are pinned to the dashboard from reports. In Power BI, a tile is a single visualization found in your report or on a dashboard. It's the rectangular box that contains each individual visual. Now, Power BI gives you the freedom to move or arrange tiles so you can present the data the way you want to. Even while you're creating a report or dashboard, you can make the tiles bigger, change their height or width, 
and snug them up to other tiles any way you want. So this was all about Power BI's building blocks. Now I'm going to take this Power BI tutorial a step further with a demonstration of creating a simple report using Power BI. Microsoft Power BI is a suite of business analytics tools that helps you create and share actionable, intuitive reports for business insights. And now I'm going to show you how you can put your data to work with Power BI. We'll go through the basics of data visualizations and dashboards, and we'll go through how to create and modify data visualizations. We'll also look at how to join data from multiple sources and build a dashboard report to share with our colleagues. So what we're going to cover today in part one will be getting started using it. Part two will talk about joining data from multiple sources and part three will talk about building and sharing a dashboard. And at the end of this we'll have a demo. So part one getting started in this section. We'll learn how to install the application. We'll talk about importing data from Excel to Power BI. We'll create and modify simple visualization and we will save our report and publish to Power BI service. Now let's talk about installing the laptop application. First what you want to do is go to http colon slash slash app dot com. Here you'll sign in with your credentials. You'll run a simple wizard to install the application. Then you will look for the download icon. It is here. It's an arrow pointing down with a line underneath it. So run that wizard and the Power BI will be ready to launch and it will automatically launch the first time that you run it. When you run it, you'll get the start screen. It is black and yellow and you'll have access to forums, the Power BI blog, various tutorials as well as some videos that you can watch and learn. But you don't need any of that videos because you have this one video. So let's go ahead. You can also access the get data functionality here from the screen. If you decide that you never want to see it again, you'll notice a checkbox in the lower yellow part of the screen that says show this page on startup. Simply uncheck that box and you won't ever see it again when you run the application. So next up you'll want to install some data after you've installed the application. You're going to go to the get data button and you'll be able to pull in data depending on what you're using. You may be using data from Excel like I'll be doing further in this demo or you may be using data from an example a SQL Server database or an access database. The options you have for pulling in data are a plethora. So there's a lot of available data sets and we'll be sticking with the Excel for my demo. But keep in mind that you can pull data from a lot of different places. So after you have selected what data you're going to be using, you'll be given the option. Then in the navigation window to select the exact data set what you want to pull, you'll check mark a box. For example, right here we have this box checked. And then you'll have the option to load the data or edit the data in the query editor. You'll probably want to edit the data in the query editor just to make sure that you'll pull in exactly what you want. Once you have pulled in the data that you want, you'll see that the data up here as a fields list on the right hand side of the application. As you can see here in the sample data, we have a budget business team delivery day. But whatever you've pulled in will appear in the fields list and you'll be able to use that data in the fields list to create your visualizations. So let's start here by creating a simple visualization. This is a very simple visual. It's simply a column chart with one number. So it's one column right here. It's the budget field that we pulled in drag whatever field that you want from your data. There is no strict rule to it and make a visualization. You'll end up with a column chart like this. You can also see that there are a variety of charts available there and then in the visualization box you will be able to make modifications to it. And like I said this right here is a bar chart but you'll be able to make pie charts column charts line charts and a variety of other visualizations in Power BI. 
A variety of modifications are available for visualizations too right here. We've highlighted where you can click on the lower right hand corner of the visualization and drag it up to make the visualization bigger or smaller. For example, you might want to make it smaller because maybe you want to put more than one visualization on the canvas there or you may be wanting to make it large so that it can take up the entire canvas. So you can drag around the corners of your visualization to make it the size that you want. The format that Power BI saves reports says .pbix file. This is not the best way to share a report, but it's definitely the best way to save your work. If you are in the middle of something, you can go ahead and save your report as a .pbix on your machine or your OneDrive. Maybe even your OneDrive for Business or a SharePoint online set wherever you're saving it. And so that way you'll be able to pick up later. If you're in the middle of building a Power BI report now, if you want to share your results of someone, the best way to do that is to publish the Power BI service. And you'll be able to do that using the publish button. That is the ribbon and that button is on the home tab on the furthest right. We have highlighted it on the slide there and then when the publishing is complete, you'll be given a link that you can click on in order to go see your workbook or your report. This will be there on your Power BI website and you'll probably want to do that just to make sure it looks as good as you wanted it to in your tool. So this is the Power BI dot com interface. The Power BI dot com interface gets changed from time to time. That is also the reason for this particular tutorial because it got updated in 2019 recently. It is a cloud service and when new features come, you may see things in a slightly different place. For example, the search bar here, I believe is slightly different now, but the gist of it is what we want and you'll be able to use that search bar once you've published a lot of reports and have a lot of data sets available on your workspace you'll be able to find them easily using the search bar or you can use the functionality of defined your recent reports as well as when you will be able to manipulate and share them using power bi.com interface. We're now going to go into part two which is using multiple data sets. So now we are going to be using multiple data sets and joining together in this section. We'll talk about adding data from other sources joining the data from multiple sources, creating more interactive visualizations, as well as updating that published data on the Power BI.com web service. So here we go with getting additional data. Now to get additional data, you do the same thing that you did before. You got your first data set and it's really not very different from how you did it. You just are having some data you're working with. You'll go to the get data button. You'll push it and our demo will be using Excel. But remember you can pull in data from a variety of sources. It is also good to keep in mind that they don't all have to be the same source. You could be using some data from an Excel spreadsheet, some data from example a SQL server query or from another database query. You can pull them all together in Power BI, create relationships and manipulate that data and create some great visualizations right here. Just as you did before, you'll select the data that you want to load and you'll probably want to edit your query before loading it just like you did before. So whenever you're loading queries, you want to make sure that you have the data that you want and your data is in the form that you want it in. Before you pull it in, Power BI will load the data that you have selected and there may be relationships in that data for example, here we have some actuals and some budget information that we are loading in sample data. But you know, you may have two different tables that you are pulling in and they both have a month column. For example, in Power BI, the tool is actually smart enough to detect the relationship and join the data together. If it did not auto detect your relationship, you'll be able to manually create it. But for most times in my experience, it does it on its own. So I want to introduce here the modeling tab. It's right next to the home tab and with the modeling tab what you can do is change some things with the format of your data. You might want to for example sort in a different way that 
then Power BI has already sorted your data and you might want to change the format you know if there's a number you want to change to a currency or maybe you've accidentally formatted some numbers as text and then it's important that you notice that you can't do any math because of course you can't do math with text and your problem then is that it's formatted as text you can easily go into the modeling tab and change the format of the data over to the number format so now you have pulled in data from multiple sources and you want to create some new visualizations well keep in mind that the canvas view here that's what we've highlighted on the slide that is the top of the three icons you see there on the top you've got the canvas view below that is the modeling tab that we just talked about and then there's also the relationship view and we'll be talking about this as well and in the demo you'll be able to create visualizations using all of the sources of your data and whatever you are using you'll be able to create visualizations with all of your data combined and that's one of the really powerful aspects of power bi as you create visualizations with your multiple data sources you'll be able to modify those just like you did before you can use the handlebars on the visualizations to drag and drop the corners around make the larger smaller fit how you want to also keep in mind that you can have more than one canvas page you certainly don't need to cram all of your visualizations onto one page if you've used excel before it's kind of like making a new sheet you'll see the bottom of the page and there's a little plus sign and you'll be able to create a second a third a fourth canvas page and add more visualizations into the same report using multiple canvas pages and made a couple of visualizations with power bi and right here what i want is to highlight the fact that you can change the colors on your report to highlight certain things for example right here we've added some black to the columns and power bi actually gives you really strong granular control over you know what your charts look like for example in a pie chart you'd even have the granular control to change the color of one slice of the pie so you really have a strong control on how your visualizations look right here now that you're done pulling in data from multiple sources you're probably ready to publish now whether you're publishing just for the first time or publishing again it's just as easy you simply go to the publish button that's on the home tab now if this is your first time publishing simply just publish it and then click on the link to go take a look at it if it's your second time publishing you'll be either given a choice to say overwrite a previous publication or you're going to rename it and publish it again as something else you'll get this wizard opening up giving you the option to go to your published report you'll go into powerbi.com's interface and view it with that we are moving into part 3 now this is the creation and sharing of dashboards in the section we'll talk about creating a dashboard and we'll talk about pinning visualizations to that dashboard We'll talk about modifying a dashboard and we'll talk about sharing that dashboard with your colleagues or customers or business partners. So you obviously might be asking a logical question, what exactly is it? Well, most of you probably kind of know what a dashboard is, but what is it exactly? And at this point it might be useful to make a distinguishing characteristic between data sources reports and dashboards. Now we all know what our data sources are. those are our excel spreadsheets sql server queries or other data based queries when we've pulled in numbers and texts and other types of data then we've built a report on top of it using power bi now once we have created visualizations on that data a dashboard is a really important aspect it really is just a type of report and what it is is that visualizations from other power bi reports are all pinned to one specific place that can be updated in real time so that your business partners and your business decision makers your customers and your colleagues can look at the dashboard and instantly have the information they need to make those important business decisions basically if you bring all your power bi reports regarding that particular decision and put them into one canvas that is when you have a dashboard it is a compact form of your complete report So now how do you create a dashboard? 
The easiest way to create a dashboard is to simply click on the pin icon which you'll see on your visualization and we'll then give you the option to create a dashboard. You'll also see as we show you on the screen here, there's a plus sign next to the word dashboards in the Power BI interface. You'll create a new dashboard there too. Once you've created that dashboard, you can continue to pin visualizations to it. Here we go, there's that pin icon there. And you'll be able to click that and attach visualizations to your dashboard. And once you've done that, you'll be able to move them around and make it look like how you want it to look like. Eventually, of course, You'll have to share that dashboard with whoever needs to see it. The pin icon will ask you which dashboard you want to pin it to. Do you want to pin it to an existing dashboard or a new dashboard? If you need a new one, go ahead and select that. But you know you're building one dashboard at a time and you're probably going to be sticking with your existing dashboard for a few visualizations at least. You can view your new dashboard with your visualizations, of course and you want to look at it before you share it. Just to make sure that it looks how you want it to, go ahead and click and share and send it to some of your colleagues. You can modify your dashboard anytime and you'll be able to click on the corners of your visualizations to make them larger or smaller just like you would want it. Now you won't have quite the degree of freedom you did with the canvas though. There are certain size settings for these visualizations. They can be so big but you can't choose exactly how big you want them like you could in the canvas. When you're in the web view, the predefined sizes is what they are called. When you're finally ready to share your dashboard, go ahead and click the sharing icon. So you'll type in the names or email addresses of the people you want to share it with. If you're dealing with a circumstance where you've got an internal and you know the global address list, you'll be able to simply type names from that. Or if you're sharing externally, you may need to use email addresses and you'll type those in and go ahead and click share. You'll notice you have some options here and you can allow the recipients also to share your dashboard. And generally, you do want to send an email notification when you share something with them. So then they'll know that it's shared with them and they'll be able to go access it. There's an option you can check as well. You can also share your dashboard once again by simply copying and pasting the URL. Once you've clicked that share button and added the person's email address or their name and shared it with them, even if they lose the link or they forget about it, they will never have to go through that process again. You'll actually just be able to copy that URL and paste it and they can view your dashboard. Apart from that, there is also a QR code generated for every report for the very same purpose. Now the first thing we need to do is that you need to install Power BI. For that you need to go to Power BI's official website that is powerbi.microsoft.com and you can directly download the option here. Let me show you how it's done. So here you have the option of Power BI Desktop. So first what we need to do is that we need to create our report. Then we'll go on to create a final dashboard which has all these insights. So what we'll do is we'll be creating a report for each of the insights in the Power BI Desktop. So here just click on download option and it'll automatically initiate the download. So once you've downloaded this file, okay, then you need to install it. It's a very easy installation step. So this is what your Power BI would look like when you've been launched. So one thing I would like recommend is that you sign in. If you've not created a sign in, then definitely make sure that you create a sign in on Power BI Desktop. So once you've successfully logged in, you get this notification here of your username as well. So let me just give you a simple overview with respect to how Power BI works. And then we'll start with respect to our session. Now, first you have a simple workspace. That is the first workspace that you're seeing is the report workspace. This is the workspace where you will be creating the different visuals as well as creating the different reports as well. Then you have the data workspace. So when you're loading a data, any data that you're working with can be viewed here. All the modifications that you want to perform with respect to the data can be done here. And finally, you have the relational workspace. Now the relational workspace is one of the useful workspace when you're working with multiple tables. Now this helps you establish as well as manage the different relationships between the multiple tables as well. Today I shall be discussing all the charts you need to build effective reports on the Power BI desktop. 
This session will take you through the various Power BI desktop charts and most importantly, when is it more appropriate to use them. We'll be going in order with which these charts are present in the desktop app. So without any further ado, let's get started. So first of all, this is my data set. I've already imported the objects into my model. I think I should explain where this data set comes from because this looks pretty morbid with all the bombs and weapons. I assure you this is no real life data. So I hope most of you have heard of if not played the game of Counter Strike Geo. For those who haven't, it's one of those first person shooter games where you go around killing a bunch of your friends. It's great. Some good clean fun, right? But the best part about it is that all the data you've generated on the game is available through an API. So I've acquired these data sets using various gamer tags and it has an entire history of how many minutes I've played, what weapons I've been using, what maps I've been playing on, how many I've killed, how often I've been shot, all this great data. And I thought it'd make for a great demo. So let's start with the charts. So first of all, I'll be creating a basic bar graph or a column graph with this for that you can use any of these given stacked bar charts, column charts, any of these, which wouldn't really matter because we are just using one case. This is basically because I want to show you guys what you can do and how you can transform these charts into its most effective form. So let's take a column chart. Now I'll be using this other data set, which I also got from the CSGO. It's a player's data set, which has a 20 players count, the kills, how many times they've been shot, the latitude and longitude from where they've been playing, etc., etc. So it's pretty simple. Actually, all you have to do is drag a column and drop it here on the field. What you can also do is you can drag the same column tab and drop it right into your graph. There you have it. Now there are a bunch of interesting things you can do with it. For example, I would like to change the color saturation according to the number of absolute kills. So green being good and red being bad. As you can see, this player number 20, despite having the best KD ratio, does not necessarily have the best absolute number of kills. So you can do a lot of cool stuff like this with the Power BI. Let's move on to our basic stacked and clustered charts. Now this entire column gives you bar and column charts. Now they are of two types mainly. One is the stacked chart and one is the clustered chart. I'll be showing you the difference between the both. Now, first of all, I'm taking the stack chart here. I'm taking a bar chart. As you can see, it's horizontal instead of vertical. On the axis, I'll be taking whether the bomb is planted or not. It's a common axis. So it's basically in a true and false situation. In the legend, I'll be taking the weapon type. So the legend is where you can specify and allot a color to each category. And in the value, I'll be obviously putting down a count. And there you have it. As you can see, the rifle has been used the most immediately followed by the pistol. Now, if I had to represent the same data using a clustered chart, this is what it will look like. I'll use a clustered column chart here and I'll drag and drop the same data, which I did for the previous chart. So basically you use both these charts when we compare different cases, depending on the same two parameters. The stack charts are where you compare things as parts of a whole, but a cluster chart is where you do the same thing, but in separate bars. So with that, let's move on. Next, we have our line and area charts. So these are the charts which usually show growth, but you can also use an area chart to show volume in some cases. Here I'll be finding out the tick rate by plotting tick against the second. On the axis, we'll take the second stab and in the values, we'll take the count of tick. So for those who have a doubt, tick rate is basically the number of times your game refreshes in a second. For people who do competitive gaming, a good tick rate would be 128. As we can see, if we calculate the slope of this graph, it's 128.48 right here. We can plot the same thing using an area graph. As you can see, the graph looks similar, but it gives us an idea of the area shaded under it. It gives us an idea of the volume. So with that, let's move on to our next chart. So here I'll be using a combination chart. 
as the name suggests, it's a combination between the bar chart and the line chart. And you can use it the same way as we did the previous charts. So on the shared axis, I'll be pulling down the players. On the column values, I'll be putting the KD ratio, or let's just put the absolute number of kills. And the line values, I'll be putting the KD ratio. As you can see, it's pretty similar to what we had inferred in our column chart. Another interesting chart here is the ribbon chart, which is like an area chart, but it shows data with respect to the maximum measure. So let's try that out as well. Now on this, I'll be plotting, let's say, the weapons used in the number of rounds. So let's bring the round to the common axis. We'll categorize the colors according to the weapon type, and then we'll bring the count of weapons to the values. See how intuitive this is, because when I just drag the weapons value to the value field, but the count it's selected on its own. So there we have it. We have the combination chart as well as the ribbon chart. As you can see, as we had inferred before, the rifle has been used most. And by just touching on each of these colors or any part of the graph, you can find out the absolute information regarding the bar. Next up, we have another one of our very common charts. You've probably all seen this one before. It's a pie chart. It's a big circle cut into pieces. Can't really miss it. A donut chart is essentially the same thing, except for that it has a smaller circle cut out in the middle, turning the filled pie into a hollow donut. It's a visual preference mainly, but there is a key difference between both of them. Let's start with the pie chart. In the legend, I'll be putting the weapon and in the values also, I'll be putting the count of weapon. I'll be doing the same thing for a donut chart as well. Closer to make it look better. So now go ahead and look at the pie chart. Notice how you look at it chances are your eyes go straight to the center, at least at first. You view the pie chart in its entirety because pie charts are filled to the center. And here's a donut chart. Because donut charts are hollowed out, there is no central point to attract your attention. So where do your eyes go instead? If you're like most people, your eyes travel around the circumference of this donut chart. You judge each piece according to its length. As a result, you can also think of a donut chart as being a stacked bar graph which has been curled around itself. So essentially, we use donut charts for its readability and the pie charts for percentage breakdowns. So next we have the tree maps which serve the same purpose but according to the hierarchy. Let's plot the same thing. Let's just plot the weapon type. There we go. With that, let's move on to the maps on BI. Now we can be using a number of maps here. The filled maps here are where you can show data density on certain states, but we'll be using the regular map because we don't honestly have so much data. So we'll be plotting where the players come from, latitude at the latitude, longitude at the longitude. For that, you'll have to categorize the latitude and the longitude as latitude and longitude in the data view. So we can also do a bunch of other things with it, like we can change the size according to the count. We can change the size of the bubbles. As you can see, wherever there's a concentration of more players, you can see the bubble is larger. You can also change the color saturation. Let's change the color saturation according to the absolute KD ratio. There you can see green being good, red being bad again. You can do something really, really similar with another tool here, which is the ArcGIS map, the latitude, the longitude, the size will be according to the count, and the color could be according to, let's say, absolute kills. There we go. You can also change the colors if you like. If you go to this formatting tab over here, the background, border, lock aspect, a bunch of different things. Another thing worth noting is that here, MSBI, this uses Bing's map engine, so it's very precise. That's also why it takes some time to plot. Next, we have funnel charts. So basically, this shows stages in progress. This is really cool. Change the color saturation. 
While I'm here, let me also explain the slicer to you people. Basically, a slicer slices the data according to how you need it, according to a certain field. Suppose I'm slicing data according to the absolute number of kills here. You can actually control the data visualization from both the sides. You can see the absolute number of kills in each bar between the 61st and the 104th kill. So that's basically how a slicer works. You can use it on maps, your pie charts. You can basically use it on any other chart that you want to. So now with the visualizations we've used so far, these have been visualizations which are used to compare values across different fields. But to create Power BI reports, sometimes you only want to show a single metric just so you can track as it changes over time. So here are a few different visuals that do it. So gauges are great if you want to show progress towards a particular target, like so. By default, you can always see double the amount of the amount shown here, but you can obviously go change it here. You can go, you can change the data labels, you can change the gauge axis, you can change the callout value, the lock aspect, a bunch of different things. You can also add other fields here like minimum, maximum or the target. So that's one thing. Another thing we can use is the card. This one here. You can also use a multi-level card, but this is a single row card. So this is the card, which just shows the numeric representation as text. By default, we use units to trim down the number, but we can also use the formatting tab to change how it shows the number. So you can do a bunch of really smart things with it, like you can use the measure and ask MSBI to return a string. Moving on. So all these numbers lend themselves to showing KPIs, where you've got a particular value and a target you're working towards. The great thing about this KPI is that it shows you an indicator and a number, as well as a trend over a period over time. You can control your goals right here again back to the formatting tab. There is the goals bar here. There's the goal and distance. You can control the trend axis. You can change the indicator and how it displays the units and so on and so forth. Now, along with these charts, Power BI also has some tabular visualizations to look at your data. For example, I'll bring the table over here. And I'll start adding fields to this. Let's say you can just go on adding tables that you want to. You can just go on adding as many fields as you want, and it'll keep giving you a total. Similarly, you have the matrices here. Now I'll be creating a very simple two by two matrix. Say the rows could be the weapons and the columns could be the weapon types and the values could be your count. A thing to notice here is when you add another field, you do not get repeated values. Hence, you get the absolute total from both sides. With that, we've got just one last visual left. I would only like to address this one as it deserves a session of its own. Now, if you're into data science, you might be familiar with something called the R. This is a really common application used to do deep analytics and statistics. It is also a great visualization platform. So MSBI allows us to integrate with R. So it basically means you can get your Power BI file over to R, get visuals to run and bring it back to the desktop and use it like any other chart. This session will be answering all your questions you have regarding KPIs and the Power BI desktop. So before we begin, let's take a quick look at the outline of this tutorial. So today we shall be discussing one, what is KPI? Next, when to use KPI? Third, what do you require for KPI? And finally, how to use the KPI visualizations in the Power BI desktop. So without much ado, let's get started. So a lot of you might wonder, what is KPI? So a KPI or a key performance indicator is a visual cue that communicates with the amount of progress you've made towards a certain goal. It basically demonstrates how effectively a company is achieving key business objectives. So organizations use this KPI at multiple levels to evaluate their success on reaching targets, both internally and externally. So high level KPI may be ones which focus on the overall performance of the enterprise. 
while low level KPIs may focus on internal things like employees in departments such as sales, marketing, etc. etc. Next, so this is a really important question when to use a KPI. So KPIs mainly answer two questions. A, what am I ahead or behind on? This specifically refers to a number which is your target. And secondly, how far ahead or behind am I? So this represents a trend which is related to the target. Since a KPI is based on a specific measure, it is designed to help you evaluate a current value and a status of the metric. So therefore, when we ask what you require for a KPI, it basically requires a base measure that evaluates to a value and a target measure. It also requires a threshold or a goal which the target is set against. So currently a KPI data set in Power BI needs to contain goal values for a KPI. So if your data set does not contain one, don't worry. You can create goals by adding an Excel sheet with goals to your data model or in a PBIX file. So this is the next segment. I'm sure most of you were waiting for this till now. So how would you use your KPI visualization? So for that, we need to open our Power BI desktop. So we'll be creating a KPI that measures the progress we've made towards a certain goal. A lot of the people will directly start with a KPI, but I personally find it more comfortable to start with a column graph and then change it into a KPI. So before we start, let's import some data. Here I have an Excel sheet with KPI appropriate data. So this is what the preview of my data looks like. We've got an actual sales column and a target sales column month wise. Here we've got the Jan to December month numbered accordingly. And here we have the fiscal month. For those who don't know, a fiscal month is basically months arranged according to the financial year of a country. Here it is April to March. Hence, I've started with one being April and 12 being March. So let's get back to our charts. So as I said, I'm going to start with a column chart here. We are just going to drag and drop values like I'm just going to take the month and drop it into the graph and then take the actual drop it into the graph. Here we have a graph. Now the thing is Power BI desktop is actually smart enough that it knows what column to take as what parameter. So now we are going to change it into a KPI. Now this is my KPI icon. We're going to be using this. Let's select the KPI icon and there we have it. Now to turn it into an actual KPI, we must have a target. So let's take the target sales and put it in the target goals field. So this is what a KPI is mainly supposed to show here. This is a number that I'm ahead or behind on and this is the trend. Now looking at it this way, you might not see a problem, but I assure you there is a problem with this. For that, I'll have to use the table. Using the table is as easy as using any other visualization here. We just take the month, drop it, the actual sales, and the target sales per month. I'll be going to the formatting pane here. I'll just increase the size by a little bit. We go to the grid, and we increase the text size. So you can see it properly there. As you can see, the months are ordered alphabetically. So this has to be changed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the month tab here, go up to modeling and here you can see an option which is sort by column. Here you can either change this to fiscal month or month number. I'm simply going to choose the month number here. There. See how our target has changed. Optionally, you can also format this KPI by choosing this paint roller looking icon right here, which is the formatting panes icon. Now here we have the indicator, which controls the indicator display units and the decimal places. Next, we have the trend axis. When it is set on, the trend axis is displayed in the background of the KPI. Next, we have the goals. When set on, the visual displays the goal and the distance from the goal. Next, we have color coding. Suppose your company follows a certain color palette. This is where you can change the colors to match your color palette. Here you can also choose the direction of your graph. Suppose high is good or low is good. For example, if it is something like earning versus wait time, typically a higher value for the earnings is better. Suppose it is something like a defaulters graph, then essentially a lower value is better. 
so you can change the color settings accordingly here good color is green bad color is red neutral color is yellow so let's get back to our graph now that you know how this tool basically works you can do some really smart things with it like you can create a measure in the model to return a string so i'll be calling this progress Now you can see the progress column is added here. What I will do is I'll be taking a card and I'll be adding the progress to its field here. So it's basically going to return the progress this year. So this is a lifestyle and it will keep changing our data set. You can also do a bunch of other interesting things. For example, instead of a single KPI, you can use a multi KPI. For that, all you must do is go to the home tab here and on the ribbon, you can see something called from marketplace. Click on it, search for something called power KPI. Okay. You can see the icon appear here with other icons on your visualization pane. You can use it like you use any other visualization here. So you can just drag and drop different values on your values. Your axis has to be a certain date does not matter what date but it can be a period or a month but it has to have a date then in your values field you can just drop actual and target there you go this also you can format using this this also you can format using your formatting pane like you can go and change your layout you can change the title suppose now it says actual and target by month you can just rename it to KPI. There are a bunch of other options you can play around with. Let's move on to something else. Another thing you can do is you can actually get a custom KPI from the marketplace again. You can just go to the KPI option. Right at the bottom somewhere, you will have something called the KPI indicator. It'll take some time to load. You can also use this like any other visualization on your visualization pane, like so. You can use it like you use any other KPI tool here. As you can see, these has vibrant colors and it shows the graph in a really nice way with these dots and indicators. What you can also do is you can go to this formatting pane and you can change the graph. You can go here to KPI general and choose a chart type. Right now we have a line chart. Then we have a line no marker where those indicators are gone. Next we can use a bar chart as well. You can choose a banding type where the increasing value is better, decreasing value is better, or the closer is better. Like the increasing and decreasing I had explained earlier in the KPI chart. The closer is better option can be used where you are testing medicines and chemicals. Here right now we have increasing is better. You can change the banding percentage. You can change the colors like you did in the previous charts. Let me get a slicer here. Now I'll go to the formatting pane and in the selection control, I'm going to turn off the single select so I can choose multiple things on the slicer. As you can see, you can use it like any other charts on your Power BI. All three of them are interacting the same way. With that, I think we've covered the KPI. Now, there's always the ambiguity that you get. So let me clear it out. A dashboard in Power BI basically is a single page wherein you have all your visualizations with respect to a specific requirement present there. Now, this dashboard could be with respect to different domains. Now, let's say if it's a HR dashboard, then what would happen is you would have the details of the employees, you would have the ratio of the employees, you would have number of employees that have come in today, you would see the number of requests that have come to the HR and so forth. Okay, now here what you're seeing basically is a marketing dashboard. Now it basically is a company based marketing dashboard where you're seeing the different opportunities, opportunity count, the revenue and so forth. So to be very short, a dashboard is just one single page of visualization which tells you a story. Now this story basically is to meet the end user's requirement. So it's up to the user who's creating this dashboard 
to customize the story as per their choice and make a happy ending as of it. Now, there is always the ambiguity as to how a dashboard is different from a report. So let's talk about that next. Now, as I had mentioned earlier, a dashboard basically is just one page canvas here, which tells you the complete story that you want to know. However, a report can contain more than one single page. What happens here is a report is way more detailed, way more incited and way more specific with respect to the requirements. So let's say if you want to have a complete analysis, then you would go for a report rather than a dashboard. Now here again, when you talk about the data sources that a dashboard can take, since a dashboard is a combination of different visuals, this basically can come from different types of reports. Thereby, you can also integrate your data from different sources as well. But when we're talking about a report, here you're mainly working with one single data set that is specifically used for that report purpose. So let's say you're going to create a marketing report, then you're going to take just the marketing data. But let's say when you're looking at an organizational data, there you're going to have data from the marketing, you're going to have marketing data from the sales, finance, and so forth then you have the option of pinning. Now, what do I mean by pinning? Basically, it means that you're adding or copying a specific visual. Now, in terms of a dashboard, you can pin an existing tile from a current dashboard to any dashboard. That is, if it's already present in the current dashboard, then you can put it to any other dashboard. However, in case of a report, you have a broader opportunity where you can pin it to any dashboard as such. If you want, you can pin the entire page of the report to your dashboard as well. Are you guys clear to hear? Good. Now, apart from that, let's say if you want to filter or modify your data to get better insights, then what happens is this cannot be done with respect to a dashboard. In your dashboard, the data is already fed. So filtering and slicing it there would not be possible. However, when you're working with a report here, you can basically filter your data. You can highlight it. You can slice it as per your requirements. You can join your data. You can separate them. You can group them. All this can be done on a report level. However, when it comes on a dashboard level, it basically cannot be done. So if you achieve this slicing or filtering on the report level, definitely it will be applicable on the dashboard. But however, it cannot be directly implemented on the dashboard. Then you have the option of alerts. That is when a certain condition is met, then you can get an alert from that. This could be on your mobile application. That is a Power BI mobile application. You could get a notification or let's say this could come to you as an email. So this again can be set on the dashboard itself. So let's say you're comparing multiple parameters. Let's say at one given point, your sales and profit values have changed. It has come down below a certain value. Then what happens is as an organizational person, you need to take the responsible measures. So this can be very useful when you're monitoring your data on a real time basis as well. And in cases when you're working with multiple dashboards to differentiate with respect to different dashboards, you can set them as featured dashboards. Now, featured dashboards basically are those dashboards which are highlighted from the rest. However, in case of the report, it cannot be set as such. And then moving on from there, you can also use natural language query. Now, what exactly is a natural language query? We'll be looking at in the later part of the session. But to give you a simple idea or an understanding here, what it basically refers to is that you can directly feed your queries in English itself. You don't need to write them as a SQL statement or anything like that. So let's say you want to identify which is my top selling store, then definitely you can just write that and your Power BI dashboard will convert it and give you the output in form of a visual. Now don't worry, we'll be seeing that as part of our demonstration as well later on. So I hope you guys are quite interested. Now apart from that, on a dashboard level, you cannot change the visual representation of a certain form of visual. That is, let's say if you're using a line chart to denote something, then as per your requirement, you cannot change it in a dashboard. So you need to go back to your report, then you need to modify it there, and then you need to pin this updated visual. So what happens is it gets updated in the dashboard as well. But when you directly modify it in the report, it does not get reflected. So you need to repin this updated visual as well. Now, when you come down to the customization capability of both, a dashboard basically uses visualizations in form of a read-only method here. So any changes that you make are basically with respect to the changing in names, you can either link them, you can resize them, rearrange them and so forth in the dashboard. However, in a report, here you have complete right with respect to the visualization as well as the data that you're working with. So you can modify it, change it as per your requirements. It's completely left to you as to how you can work around with it. So are you guys clear with respect to both? How a report is different from a dashboard? Okay, I seem to have a question here. Do we need to create reports for dashboards? Definitely you do because it's from the reports that you will be going on to create a dashboard. So to put it more simply, reports give you a complete idea. 
whereas a dashboard will give you a complete overview. So based on your requirements, you can use whichever meets your necessity. So moving forward, let's look at the data set that we'll be working with today. So we are going to work with a superstore data set of a United States organization, which was collected basically from 2011 to 2016. Okay. Now I'll be showing you the data set as well. Just a minute. So this is your complete data set. You have basically the date of order. You have shipping date, the ship mode, the customer ID, customer name, which segment it was from, postal code, city, state, country. Apart from that, you have region, market, the product ID, the category, subcategory, and so forth. Okay. So I hope you've got a general idea of what the data set looks like. Okay. That's great. So what we need to do is we need to mainly achieve four insights from these data. First, what we need to identify is the overall performance. That is, we need to identify the sales and profit of our complete superstore. Okay. Apart from that, we'll also try to identify the performance in different regions and we'll see which are profitable regions and which are non-profitable regions. Then what we'll do is we'll try to identify the performance of each state as a whole. Okay. Now, which state is going to show you the opportunity of growing, which is basically pulling your market down and which is something that you can look forward to in investment or marketing as well. Okay. After that, you have inside three where we'll be seeing the performance of different segments involved in the superstore and how do they contribute as well. Finally, what we'll be doing is we'll try to understand the revenue generated by each category of product. Now, there are different categories of the product. So we'll see which category is hampering our growth and which is feeding our growth as well. Okay. Are you guys clear? And here, the first thing we need to do is that we need to import the data set. Now for that, you have this option here called get data. So click on get data. And you have the most common data types here. You have Excel, Power BI service, SQL server, analytical service. So for seeing the complete list, click on more. And here you have the complete list of different data sources that you can connect with respect to our Power BI desktop. Now we're going to work with an Excel file. So let me just click on Excel and it's going to ask me the location. So let me just go down global superstore and it's establishing a connection to the data set. Okay, so since my data set has multiple pages, it shows me the different pages as well. You have orders, you have people and you have return. Once you are on a sheet, it extracts about 200 rows and gives you an overview with respect to what is present in your data set. Okay, this basically helps you verify what data set you're working with and is it a valid data set or not. So since we need only orders detail, let me just click on orders and then click on load. So now we can see successfully the data has been loaded because you can find the options of fields here. Okay. So this basically is with respect to the orders table. So let's say if you're working with multiple tables, each one of the tables as well as all the columns present in those tables would be highlighted here. Okay. So this is where we'll be working around with. Now to get a more insight with respect to your data, you can go to the data workspace and here you have the complete preview of your data. So this is your complete data set present here and you get to see whatever data is present and if you wish to perform any operation on this. So let's say if you want to modify this data, then you can click on edit queries option here and you get the query editor. So this becomes the workspace where you can perform all your different operations on your actual data set. Now by default Power BI does perform certain amount of operations on your data while it's loading itself. So these steps can be viewed here. Okay, so any operation that you don't want Power BI to do can be removed here. Or let's say if you are performing any operation, then that also can be removed from this option here. So every step that you perform gets added to the supplied step option. So for now, let me just close this and let's go back to our workspace. So first what we'll be doing is we'll be trying to create a sample visuals. Okay, so this basically will give you a feel of how Power BI works. So what we'll be doing is let me call it profit leaders here. So to rename any report, you can just double click there and let's call it profit leaders. Okay. Now what I'll be doing is I'm going to create a combination of my different states as well as the profits that each of them have bought. So let me just bring in the states. Okay. So this basically is going to create a default visualization. Okay. And since it's states, what it's doing is trying to put it on a map visual. Okay. So for that, what I'll do is I'll add in the profit details as well. Okay. Now when I add the details of profit, what happens is it sees the difference with respect to the size. So let me just uh, filter a little more. I'll add in details with respect to the country as well. Okay. So this basically will filter out all the data. So let me just bring this up. And here you can see the profit across different states that I am making in different countries as well. Okay. 
So this basically is a geographical representation of all the profit that I'm making across the globe. Okay, now let me show you how to filter out the data as well. Okay, now when you come down in your fields option, you have this option called filters. Now in filters, if you click on country, okay, you can see all the countries present here. Now if I just select one specific country, so let's say, let me take United States. Okay, then what happens is my complete visualization changes with respect to United States alone. Okay, so here basically it becomes with respect to United States. Okay, so all the profits that you're seeing right now is with respect to the different states in United States. Okay, so if you just go down, hover over them, you can see the different profits. And you can see some states are negative. Okay, so what happens is I need to identify which are my positive states and which are my negative states. So what we'll do is we'll try to change the colors with respect to which they are represented. So for that, go to the next field that is the format field. Okay, now here you have the option of data colors. Now the same size with respect to the profit scene can also be represented in a different map based system also that's called field map system. Wherein what actually happens is that the color intensity of each of the states is with respect to the value of profit that they make. Now let's say if you want to variate the value to identify the regions which make profit with the format tab here under data colors option you have something known as divergence. When you turn on divergence what basically happens is there's a variation with respect to the color. So let me just change this color setup as a whole because it seems a bit confusing right now. So I'll make the minimum as light green. Okay, I'll make the middle as the medium green and finally the maximum as dark green. Okay, so this basically helps me get a better idea with respect to this as well. Now let's say if you want to go more detail, let's say the minimum or let's say the center. Okay, I'll set it as zero. Okay, that means states which are not giving me negative profits are center. Okay, states below that should get, uh, let's say, I'll give them a blue color. Okay, center, let me give it a different color, let me say yellow. And the maximum profit making states are in green. Okay, so here it starts from blue. Okay, when you look at Texas, it has a complete negative value. Okay, these are my mid-level profit making states. But whereas California is giving me one of the highest profits, similar to New York as well. Okay. So you can see the variation with respect to the color and how we have modulated with respect to that. So I hope you guys have got a simple feel of how to create a visual with respect to Power BI. Okay, I have another question here. It's how do you know which visual to work with? Okay, so by default you get multiple date kinds of visuals present in Power BI itself and there are a lot of custom visuals as well. So it is completely left to you as a representator as to what form of visual that you want to represent it. Certain data that may be represented in a pie chart would be very helpful. But when I bring it back to a bar chart or a line chart, it may not give me a clear cut picture. So it's finally in your hands to decide which kind of visuals to use. Are you clear? Okay, so let's go back to our presentation and start with the first insight. Now the first thing we need to identify is the overall trend with respect to our sales and profit as well as get an insight with respect to the different regions and identify the regions which are profitable and non-profitable. So for this let me go back to our Power BI and let's begin by creating our first insight. So let me begin by creating a new page for this report. So click on this option plus here to create a new page. Okay. And let me call it overall performance. So double click. And then we're set. Now what we need to do is that we need to identify the sales and profit. Okay, so for that drag sales from here, drop it on your workspace and similarly drag profits. Okay, by default what is happening is you're creating a clustered column chart. Okay, now you can change it as per your requirement. So let's say you want to create a line chart. So just click on line. So the sales and profit data gets converted to a line chart here. But since we don't have a second parameter or the axis based on which these values have to be mapped, it's just giving me two points. Now this is the sum of sales and sum of profit that I have made on a given interval. So for that, what I'll do is that I'll bring the order date, that is the date on which it was ordered. Okay, so when I said order date here, you get different parameters here. You have year, quarter, month and day. So let me remove year. I'll make remove month and day and I'll make it in terms of quarter. So it is giving me in a reverse order that is with respect to the different quarters. So you can see here it is giving me a descending order as to the sales and profit. Now this is basically because it is getting sorted with respect to the quarter. To change that just click on the three dots here. Okay, then you can see it by default it has set sort by quarter. So you can change it sort by sales or sort by profit. 
So you can see here by default it is giving me quarter 4, quarter 3, quarter 2 and quarter 1. Okay, so I want it in ascending order. This is something that is set by default. So to change that just click on the three dots present here. Okay, you can see it is following a descending order. So I want to make it in ascending order. So just click it again and then you can see it changes into an ascending order. Where it's quarter 1, quarter 2, quarter 3, quarter 4. Okay, so the size seems a bit small. So let me just increase that as well. So let me make it 20. Similarly, let me increase here as well on the Y axis. So this is basically how you can increase the size of the font that are present with respect to the different axes. So I hope this is a little more clear. So you can see with respect to quarter one, my sales was close to 2 million wherein I had made a profit almost about $240,000. But when I went to quarter two, it increased my sales reached about 3 million and my profit equally increased to 325 million. Finally, by third quarter, I had a sale close to 3.5 million, but a profit at the same time was more. It was about $400,000. Finally, in my four, quarter four, I had a sale close to 4.3 million, at the same time, a profit of $500,000. Okay, so let me just increase the legend size as well, because it, this is your legend. So it helps me identify which is my sales line, which is my profit line as well. So here again, let me make it, let's say 20 itself. And let's say if you want to change the color of the line as well, you can do that in the data color option here. So sales can, let's say if you want to give it a blue and for profit, let's say I'll go with red. Okay, so this is a blue and red combination that is happening here. Okay, now one thing you need to understand is this is a combination of the different quarters data. Now this data as I had mentioned is a collection of number of sales from 2011 till 2015. Okay, so here what happens is all the dates get grouped up with respect to the different quarters. So this value that you see, okay, this basically is a summation of all the sales and profit you have made in the first quarter for the year 2011, 2012, 13, 14 and 15. Okay, so this is a complete combination with respect to that same. Okay, that's the only reason that you have four points as well. But if this was not happening, then you would have 20 points rather than four points. But now what is happening is it's combining the different quarters. Then it is helping me understand what is happening exactly. Now, let's say if you want to filter this data a little more. So let's come back to our fields tab. And here I come down. You can see here the different options already present here. You can see with respect to the different quarters. You can see with respect to different profit as well as sales. Now let me bring in something interesting here. So let me bring in my category here as well. So just drag and drop category here and it gets added. So let's say I want with respect to only furniture. So if you select furniture, okay, the visualization completely changes. So earlier when I was making 2 million sales, now it's only $670,000. These are actual sales amount and my profit is close to $50,410. So again, this basically variates because this is the details with respect to my furniture. Now let's say if I remove furniture and add office supplies, then it slightly changes with respect to that same. So are you guys clear with respect to how a data visualization is created and how we've achieved the first insight? Any doubts with respect to that? Now if you remember this insight is not complete because we need to identify this with respect to the different regions as well. So what we'll do is come back to our filter option. Let me just select all, minimize this and let me add in the region option from here to my visual level filter. Okay, so what happens here is that I can see all the different regions present here. Okay, so here these are the different regions. You have Canada, Caribbean, Central Africa, Central America, Central Asia, Central US, Eastern Asia, Eastern Europe and so forth. So you have different regions as well. So what we'll be doing is, so let's say I want to see it with respect to Eastern Asia. When I click on Eastern Asia, the visualization takes a change again here. So with respect to Eastern Asia, I had made a 150,000 worth sale and I had made just a profit of 30,000. Okay, although it grew in my fourth quarter to almost 300,000 and a 60,000 profit, let me check another region. Let me come down, let me see the Eastern US region. Okay, so here you can see a huge growth. My first quarter, there was just a $65,000 sale. But when I come to my fourth quarter, it's still 300,000 and my profit is 44,000 only. Okay, so this helps me identify which are the regions that are not doing well and which are the regions that I can put my interest to or market my products more. Okay, so if I again come back here, if I say Central America, so you can see here it is not a normal growth. So I had 150,000 in the first quarter, second quarter is almost the double, third quarter is close 
to the second quarter itself but my fourth quarter is really high so this means that there has been a growth in the fourth quarter as well as the second quarter so this basically calls in more investigation so i need to try to understand why there was not much growth in the third quarter but at the same time what led to the growth with respect to these two quarters okay so i hope this helps you identify what are the insights also that you can receive from these visualizations so moving forward let's look at the second insight that we need to achieve as part of today's session we need to identify the performance of different states okay so for this what we'll be doing is we'll go back to our power bi and let me create a new page i'll rename this state performance okay so here what we're going to do is first we're going to create a visualization and then we're going to give it the input so let me select the visualization that is a scatter chart okay and you can see it has been added here to this what i'll do is i'll take my sales from here add it to my x-axis i'll take my profit add it to my y-axis and then what i'll do is i'll add my state details here so this basically becomes a scatter plot here okay now what i'll do is let me come down let me add a filter where in my country is just united states so this basically will give me a state wise representation of the different profits i make in united states okay so this is basically a scatter plot between my profit to my sales okay so you can see here the highest profit to sale ratio is from california where i have almost 460,000 worth sales and a profit of 80,000. At the same time, this is followed by New York. New York has almost close to $311,000 worth sales and it has a profit of 74,000. So it's almost close because these regions have a huge difference with respect to sale amount, but the profit is almost same in New York. Okay, but when you come down to this region, the next state that is following it is Washington. Now, Washington, what is happening is that I have just 138,000 worth sale and my profit is 33,000. But when you see this line, right, this line is what you need to concentrate on. Let me first increase the size of the font here. So go back to our filter. Okay. Yeah, this should be better. Now, if you see here, these are the regions that are giving me negative profit. That is, I'm wasting my money here. Even though these regions are bringing in sales, but they're not bringing in any profit. So if you look at the state of Texas, I have almost 170,000 worth sales coming there. But my profit is in a negative figure, which is minus 25,000. That basically tells me that I'm investing way more to get these sales than making a profit. So these become the regions which I need to concentrate more. Okay, that is, these are my highest priority states. Okay, apart from that, Let's say you want to add a specific trend line here. So for that, you need to come to the analytics tab here. So trend line basically is a reference line that you can set, okay, based on your overall growth. So this is your standard sales to profit growth. So anything above this is definitely good for you, but anything below is not really good. Now, let's say you don't want a trend line. Let me remove this, let's come back. Let's say you want to add an x-axis constant line. So let me add the value of, let's say, which are the regions that come below the x-axis value of uh, 100,000, okay? So these are the regions that I need to improve my sales. Anything that is on the right side of this definitely is doing good in terms of sales. But same time, let me add a y-axis constant line. So let me keep the value of the y constant about 22,000. Okay, this is basically a rough number, okay? So anything below this and the intersection, this area, right this is supposed to be my highest priority area anything below this definitely requires an attention so if i divide them into different quadrants let me just write it down here let me call this one let me call this two let me call this three and let me call this four okay yeah i'm sorry with respect to how it looks odd but i hope this gives you a general idea here okay now here what happens is quadrant one does not need any attention because these are my high priority quadrants and anything here is also bringing me good sales and good profit as well quadrant two can improve itself it can slowly move to quadrant one so i need to concentrate more with respect to the sales okay so it is bringing me profit but again i need to increase my sales in this region quadrant three is the biggest mess here 
even though it is bringing me good amount of sales but the profit is negative this basically means that i am throwing away my money in these regions as such quadrant 4 are the regions which are performing moderately okay but in terms of numbers they are not really anywhere they are neither crossing my threshold in number of sales nor are they crossing my threshold in number of profit so this is going to be my second region of interest my first priority is going to be the regions in quadrant 3 and my second priority is going to be the regions in quadrant 2. Slowly if I have time I can try pushing the states in quadrant 2 to quadrant 1 and quadrant 1 is always above my benchmark. But this doesn't mean that you don't put any attention to this region. Okay, you can always come up with new ideas to increase them beyond. Okay, maybe some understanding as to why only these three regions are making this may help you grow with respect to all your quadrants as well. Okay, so these are just some of the various insights you can get from these visuals. So are you guys clear with respect to the insights that we have achieved here? Any doubts with respect to what I have discussed? Great. So the third insight what we'll be doing is we'll try to identify a segment wise performance. Okay, we'll see how each of the segments are doing in the different states. So let's go back to our Power BI desktop. Now let me create a new page here and let me bring the categories here. Okay. So rather than taking the categories what I'll take is the subcategories. So this will give me a broader idea. So I'll bring in the subcategories okay, and I'll add to it the number of sales. So this basically is going to be represented in a table form. But a table form is not really helpful for me. So what I'll do is I'll put it in a clustered bar chart. So when I do it in this way, it becomes a clustered bar chart giving me the different sales made by each of the subcategory. Okay, now what I'll do is I'll variate it a little bit. Okay, now to this what I'll do is I'll just bring in the profits as well. Okay, so I'll add the profit into the color saturation option. Okay, so this you can see has variated. Now if you go back to your format option, you have data colors here. Okay, so here let's again enable divergence. Okay, so let me make it light green. Let me make it mid green and let me make it dark green. So you can see with respect to which are the categories that are giving you profit and which are giving you sales. So if you see phones are the regions with respect to the maximum sales. However, copiers are the regions with respect to the maximum profit. Okay, so this also gives me a different insight with respect to how these regions are performing. Okay, so this again can be represented in a different way. You can also try this out with a pie chart, but this is my suggestion. So here's a homework for you. Why don't you try representing the same chart in a different way and it'll be interesting for you as well. So let me just rename this finally once more. I'll call it segment performance. Okay, and let's go back to our presentation and let's see the final insight that we need to get. Now this basically is to identify the revenue generated by each category of the product. Okay, and identifying which category of product is hampering my growth. Let me create a new page. So I'll call it revenue generated. Okay, so who can tell me what are the different data that I need for this visualization? You can take a guess guys. Okay, yes, so I need the category definitely. So let me put in category. I need my sales. I need my profit. And finally, let me also bring in the order date. But here what I'll do is in my order date, I'll just take year instead of months. This will help me understand how the different category of products are function throughout the year. So what I'll do is I'll just variate it a bit. Let me take a line chart graph. So here what happens is you can just see two things that is with respect to furniture, office supplies and technologies, the sales to profit ratio. Okay, so let me just full screen this. Now here what happens is you have the option of going to the next level of hierarchy. So if you just click on this, what happens is it becomes sales and profit by year. Okay, so you have sales profit per year. So this is a sales per profit distribution. But when you go up, what happens is it's the profit made by each of the categories overall. Okay, now I'll just bring this down. So here what I'll do is I'll just remove the categories from here and then it just becomes a sales to profit ratio. Okay, that is the sales and profit made in different years. Here what you can do is that you can actually filter it. So to my visual level filter, what I'll do is I'll bring in the categories. So this basically will help me identify the sales and profit made in each of the year. So let's say for furniture alone, this is the sales to profit ratio made in each year. 
So 2012, 2013, 14, and 15. Okay, similarly with respect to office supplies, you get a number, let's say furniture and office supplies. So this is a different number and you can work around with respect to that. So this will give you an insight with respect to all the three categories. At the same time, you can also compare multiple categories together. Okay, so this rather than applying it directly to the visual can be added as a filter to your visual. Okay, so with this, we've achieved the four major insights that we're trying to achieve at the beginning of the session and we've created multiple reports for this. Now it's time that we go on to create our dashboard. Before that, what you need to do is that you need to save this file. So let me save it. So let me call it my first dashboard. Okay, so here when I save it, it's going to be saved in form of a .pbix file, which is a supported file from Power BI. Now that I have saved it, it's time that I publish it to my second Power BI interface that is Power BI Search. That is going to be the interface where we will be creating our dashboard. So for that, what you need to do is that you need to publish. So this is one of the major reasons that I had mentioned that you need to sign up for Power BI. Okay, because this is going to go to Power BI service, which is an online browser based interface. And that's where we want to create our dashboard. Once you click on publish, so you can see it's publishing to my Power BI service. Okay, so here itself you get the notification that it has successfully published it to my Power BI and click on open Power BI dashboard. Okay, so you can see here the browser is opening this report. So you can see here it has been opened as different pages for a report. Now let's say if you want to edit this report, you can do that on Power BI service as well. So just click on edit reports and you have almost the same features present here as you had in Power BI desktop. But again, what I need you to understand is you cannot manipulate the data that is associated to this report. To do that, you need to work it on your Power BI desktop, not on Power BI service. Okay, so here let's say let me remove this. So this is profit region with respect to all. This was the sample representation that we had created first. So this also has a next level of hierarchy if you see. Okay, so what is happening here is that it is considering the whole profit of United States rather than individual states. So if you go to an upper view, it basically becomes this. So that in turn would be helpful when you're working with different countries. Okay, so we had set a filter here that the country is just United States. Okay, now if I remove this, okay, then it sort of becomes a mess. So if I do that, you, it happens to be a global level representation. Okay, so that time it becomes slightly hard for you to identify which. So that time what happens is you need to see the bigger picture here. So you can drill down to your visual report and then what happens is it becomes a representation in terms of a global scale. So earlier what was being represented as individual states now becomes with respect to different countries. So now it's time that we begin by creating our first dashboard. Okay, so in, you have the option here of reports dashboard. So you have the option of workspace. So you can work with multiple workspaces. Okay, so by default, you'll be working in my workspace. And under that, you have first report that I had created earlier and the present report that you were working with, that is my first dashboard. So you can also load an Excel workbook here in case if you want to use a workbook for different visualizations. And apart from that, you have the data sets associated to the different reports also present here. Okay, now let me show you how to create a dashboard. Now creating a dashboard is quite easy. All you need to do is just click on the pin visual option. Okay, and it'll ask you whether you need to pin to an existing dashboard or create a new dashboard. Now since there are no existing dashboards, I'm going to create a new dashboard. I'll call it my first dashboard and I'll pin to it. Okay, similarly, I'll take my state performance. Okay, I'll pin it to my dashboard. Segment performance also goes to my first dashboard. So you can see here by default, it is showing me it there's a dashboard present. So when you work with multiple dashboards, you can select it accordingly. Go to pin. Let me take revenue generated also. I'll pin it there. Okay. So with this, we've pinned all the visuals that we have created to our dashboard. So let me show you how, how the dashboard would look like. So here you can see now there's an entry for my first dashboard. If you click on that, you have all the four visuals that you had created as part of your dashboard. So this is what a dashboard would look like in a web view. But let's say if you want to see it in terms of a phone, view, that is if in an app, how it would look like. So just do the same, you just you can change it here. So this is how it would look on the phone application. 
So this would again vary with respect to how it is set on your phone. The screen size and everything would magnify the image, but don't worry. Okay, let's go back to the web view. Now here, let's say if you want to set it as feature. So then you have the option of set as feature. So if you say set as feature, this becomes your feature dashboard as such. Okay, then you have the option of favoriting the dashboard. So when you're working with multiple dashboards, then it becomes easy for you to manage with it. Then you have the option of sharing your dashboard. Now to do that, you need to upgrade your account to Power BI Pro, which basically would cost you only $10 a month. Okay. They do have a 30 days trial period as well, but since I've completed mine, I presently is being disabled. So once you do that, you can always share this report to anyone that you want. Okay. Now let's say if you want to reorder this as well, it's quite simple. It's just a drag and drop operation. So let me show you one of the most unique feature that Power BI dashboard allows you to. This basically is your Power BI q &A. So let's say if you want to have any idea with respect to your data, let me ask which state has highest sales. So this tells me which state is bringing me the highest sales. So it's coming from England. Okay. And accordingly, it has given me a visual with respect to all the states. That is, it's giving me the maximum first and correspondingly, it is following a descending order. Okay, so let's say which state has the highest profit. Let's see with respect to profit. So let's say profit. Okay, now again, you can see it is changing here. So it's England again here, but the values have changed. Okay, so if I say profit and sales, so now it has completely changed. It's giving me a scatter plot. Okay, but this is slightly different from the scatter plot that we have created. This is on a global scale. And this basically is an insight that is being achieved through Power BI's Q&A feature. So for any dashboard that you create, you can use Power BI's Q&A feature, wherein you can simply just put across your queries and Power BI will create a data visual and give you a complete insight. Today we are going to discuss two of the most talked about tools in the business intelligence and data visualization market. Yes, I'm referring to Power BI and Tableau. But before we get into the details of these two tools, let's quickly take a look at today's agenda like we always do in all of my sessions. Well, I would be discussing these two tools based on these parameters that is visualization, cost of ownership, integration, data management and finally functional comparison. Now for functional comparison, I've again jotted down few parameters and we would be discussing these two tools based on those parameters as well. So let's not waste any time and get started with this discussion then. Visualization. Well, it completely boils down to your preference. So let us take a look at these two tools one by one. First, we have Power BI. Now, if you're looking for something called as custom visuals, then Power BI is a clear winner. Why? Because it has opened up its SDK for visualization and that has given you more custom visuals. Plus it has great drag and drop features. It has good data import capabilities. That is why if you're looking for custom visuals any days Power BI is a winner here. As far as Tableau is concerned, it gives you pure visualization. If you're somebody who likes the curated approach or more clean sleek kind of an approach, you can always go for Tableau. Why is that? Because it would give you great drill down features. It would give you amazing visualizations. So as far as visualization is concerned, Yes, if you ask me for my opinion, I would say Tableau is a clear winner here. Next we have cost. So when you take a look at cost, we have to consider something called as initial cost. Now, if you ask about initial costs, Power BI wins. Why? Because it is way cheaper compared to Tableau. If you compare its desktop user cost, if you compare its web user cost, server node, Power BI is a winner here. But then this is not the only cost you should take into consideration. When you talk about business intelligence, you have to consider other costs costs that can be considered on the longer run. So are there any other parameters which we can consider for the longer run cost? Yes, definitely. And if you compare those parameters like labor costs, total cost of delivery and all those things, uh, this is where I feel Tableau is or has little more edge compared to Power BI. Why? Because on the longer run, when you compare its labor costs, its total usage cost and all those things, even though your initial cost is more, Tableau gives you more affordable kind of a software when you look at from the longer run perspective or the total cost of ownership perspective. So if you ask me for my opinion again, I would be choosing the longer run thing and for now Tableau is a winner here as well. Third on this list we have integration. 
Now integration again, it kind of boils down to perspective like the visualization factor did. This is because these two serve completely different functionalities. If you take a look at Power BI, it gives you great integration capabilities. How it acts more like a Swiss Army knife. That is, it readily integrates with various other tools. Now it's a Microsoft product, and there are various other Microsoft products in the market that various businesses use. And since Power BI lets you integrate with these two tools, it kind of has an edge over Tableau because it can integrate with various tools like. You have reporting services, Excel, SharePoint, and all those things. So, all in all, when you talk about integration capabilities, yes, Power BI gives you a lot more options. Tableau, on the other hand, it takes in more of a scalable kind of an approach or a surgeon-like approach, where if you are dealing with a particular defined kind of a problem or you need more curated kind of an approach, then you should go for Tableau, which gives you sleek and clean visualizations. But if your main aim is integration, Yes, Tableau is a great tool, but Power BI has to win here. So, if you ask me for my vote, yes, it would go for Power BI definitely. Next, we have something called as data management. Now, when you talk about data management, you have to talk about data shaping, data modeling, data analytics, and all those things. Let's take a look at those one by one. Data shaping, Power BI, great. Tableau, it's good, but Power BI, it's great. Why? It has something called as query editor that uses M language and basically it lets you do so many things with ease and you do not have to worry about switching into Excel every now and then because your Power BI kind of takes care of it there and there. So yes, it does help you. And if you ask about Tableau, even the people who use Tableau would complain saying that there's too much to earn for between Excel and Tableau. If there was a solution for it, it would have been much better. So when you talk about data shipping, Power BI wins. Data modeling, again, Power BI has to win your why. DAX, Power Pivot, and that SQL framework basically which it has definitely gives it an edge when you talk about data modeling. Analytics, again, Power BI. Why? Because Power BI is very fast. Yes, it does not have as clean and curated approach as Tableau, but overall data management, if you ask for my vote, any day Power BI. Next on this list, we have something called as functional parameters. So what are those parameters? Well, these are a few of the parameters which I have gone ahead and jotted down. We have the year of establishment. Now, Tableau had a great head start here because it started 10 years prior to Power BI, but Power BI is kind of catching up. But if you talk about overall organizational approach for a data visualization tool, Tableau has more experience compared to Power BI, but Power BI is definitely catching up. Applications, now, as I've already mentioned, custom visualizations or more open source approach is what you're looking for. Power BI is your thing. More curated and clean approach. Tableau. So if you need something like custom visuals, da dashboards, you can go for Power BI. Ad hoc analysis and longer run operations related to data visualization, Tableau. Users, well, as far as my personal experience is concerned, Tableau is a little difficult to learn when you compare it with Power BI. Power BI is much easier to learn and it is for the wider applications given the integration capabilities it has. But that is a personal opinion. I don't want you to jump into that because People who have used more Tableau might find Tableau easier to use. So that kind of boils down to your preference, really. If you ask me, I like Power BI more when you talk about ease of use. I have had varying opinions for people as well. So you are the best judge and you are the one to decide on those things. Support Tableau wins here clearly. It has better support compared to Power BI. Scalability, good. Power BI is good, but Tableau is great. If you talk about applications on the longer run, better scaling, Tableau has to win here. Infrastructure, again, both take a completely different approach. Your Power BI gives you SaaS kind of an approach, which is software as a service, whereas Tableau gives you more flexible kind of an approach where you're free to like, or not free, but more flexible kind of an approach, basically. So these are the parameters I felt that we should have discussed. There are quite a few other parameters where these two tools can be compared. And as I've already mentioned that these two tools are very neck and neck or very close to each other. These are two of the most talked about tools or the hottest tools when you talk about business intelligence. And it would be unfair to say this is a clear winner or that is a clear winner. It actually boils down to your preference. The best way for you to decide is to go ahead and use both of these two tools. Those are readily available to you and very easy to learn. So you can pick those and decide it on your own, which tool is good for you or great for you. And that would also depend on the problem statements which you have or which you need to solve. As far as this video is concerned, I just wanted to give you a picture as in how do these two tools fare based on these parameters.
I welcome you all to today's webinar on Power BI interview questions. So the idea is to over the next uh, one hour or so, the idea is to walk you through some of the most commonly asked interview questions in Power BI. So we're going to be focusing on a lot of conceptual topics, a lot of theoretical questions and a lot of practical questions. And the idea is to not only walk you through the questions, but also to actually take you through a very, very good demonstration and just to give you a very good approach and idea on how to answer some of those questions. Okay. So I'll try to connect a lot of these questions to real life scenarios so that when you're asked a question next time in your interview, you're not only giving out a theoretical answer, but you're actually able to connect with practical examples and use cases and stuff like that. So we're going to try to make it as broad as possible. And obviously the idea here is we have picked up a very, very limited set of questions, but it's a pretty good and some of the most important questions that we have picked up for this specific webinar. So first of all, uh, we have broken it down into a few general subtopics. So first of all, I'll be focusing on a few general Power BI questions. And obviously, what is self-service business intelligence? So needless to say, Power BI, the very fact is that Power BI is one of the most popular SSBI tools in the marketplace today. And uh, any of you who have worked on other BI tools coming from the world of Tableau or ClickSense or Spotfire, you can also relate to this. So if you are asked a question, what is self-service BI? I think the first approach to take is to explain what is SSBI, okay? Now, any of you, as I said, if you have come from the world of traditional business intelligence, right? If you have worked on tools like SSRS, uh, Cognos, if you come from MSBI world, or if you use the business objects, you typically have used tools where it's not exactly built for end users, right? So essentially building reports or building any kind of project used to take a lot of time. Obviously for developers, it's a very easy tool to use. But if you think of end users at the end of the day, if you think of the business users or the end users or, uh, you know, non-technical people would find it very, very difficult to use something like say a Visual Studio to develop MSP SSRS reports. Okay, so that's the world of traditional BI where development cycles were long and there's a big hindrance, right? So if, if business users want answers to certain questions, let's say if a mutual fund manager wants to know how has my fund performed over the last 10 years in a form of a very simple line chart, that mutual fund manager has to go back and depend on his internal IT team to go back and build that chart for him. It could be a very simple line chart, but as I said, a mutual fund manager may not be that well versed in a traditional BI tool like an SSRS, okay? So they will be depending on the internal in-house IT team and that way the overall process will become pretty slow because the IT team will have their own requirement gathering process. They'll have their own software development framework which they'll follow and probably a very simple activity which would ideally have taken less than 10 seconds to build right on paper. Line chart is so simple but then it could easily take two three weeks depending on a lot of factors. So this is exactly where self-service BI comes in. And self-service BI is an approach to data analytics that enables business users to filter, segment, and analyze their data. And this is the key where the, the key is really to focus on business users. And you can either say business users or you can say end users, customers. So essentially non-technical people who are the real consumers of this particular tool. Okay. And what is the benefit of using this? And if you just compare to the scenario just I discussed just a while back. Now here, the mutual fund manager can directly use a tool called Power BI and he can directly connect to the data. He can directly build the line chart all by himself. Okay. So obviously the development cycle will be much faster and the business user will be happier because you know he has control of his data. He has control of exactly what he's seeing and he's not dependent on any external team. Okay. So it's a win-win approach. It's a win-win approach. The end user is happy. The IT team is also happy because sometimes what happens in traditional BI projects, especially if there is a requirement involved, typically in requirement gathering phases as we have all encountered, right? There are so many iterations that take place, right? You do requirement gathering, you do one phase of requirement gathering and then something misses, something gets missed and you come back, you build a product and the customer is not happy with the product. So you go back and build it again, you iterate over it, right? So those kind of problems can crop up, especially in traditional approaches. But that is something that's completely out of the picture in an SSBI approach because the business user himself or herself is building the report and there is no question on dependency and whatever they want, they are building. So essentially it's a win-win situation. And as I said, it's a very easy process and anybody who has basic understanding of data can create reports to build intuitive and shareable dashboards. So when you answer this question, it's very important to give the understanding, give the basic understanding of what are the challenges of traditional BI, what are the challenges of uh, some of the other top BI tools, and where does SSBI fit in? It's, it shouldn't be a very bland answer just that, you know, what is SSBI and the Power BI as an SBI tool, but try to be as broad as possible. Try to give context on where SSBI comes from, why is SSBI important, and what are some of the other tools? Remember, Power BI is a very small part of the whole landscape. The BI landscape is dominated by tools like Tableau, like Spotfire, like ClickSense, in the data visualization SSBI landscape. And if you talk about SSBI in analytics, there's also tools like Alteryx, which are really revolutionary. And you can you can take these examples and that will really get to show your depth and breadth of knowledge in the entire BI space. Okay, so moving on, 
next question what are the parts of microsoft sales service bi solution so as i mentioned the ssbi question in, in the beginning was purely a very general question now we are being more focused on microsoft stack so we are focused on the entire microsoft stack and obviously when you talk about the microsoft stack we are talking about primarily two toolkits here so one is obviously the excel bi toolkit and the other is the power bi toolkit okay now some of you might be wondering why am i using excel bi toolkit so if this question is asked to you in the interview what do you actually say do you actually mention excel bi do you mention power bi because obviously we are discussing power bi so it's natural we'll be talking about power bi but it is also very very important that you mention excel bi because remember power bi is nothing but an extension of the excel add-in components right so if any of you have worked in excel and i'm assuming all of you have worked in excel and i don't mean to say working in excel in a spreadsheet application so obviously excel is a spreadsheet application we have all of us have used it even if we have don't even if we say that we don't work in excel all of us have seen excel spreadsheets right but what i really mean to say is excel from the standpoint of some of its add-in components some of its add-ins components like the power bi components of excel like power query power pivot power view and when you think about these components what are they they are actually helping you build bi solutions right within excel now i know it comes as a surprise for many people initially to believe that power bi actually came from excel but that is the truth when you think about the origins of power bi when you think about how power bi came into existence it came into existence from Excel. So whatever you have in Power BI is nothing new, right? So all these components have already been there in Excel for a long time, okay? So when you think of uh, Power Pivot, Power Pivot was actually launched as an add-in. Okay, when you think of Power Query, again, Power Query was launched way back. Power View is again a very, very integral component of Excel. So all these components were already existing in Excel. And all that Power BI Desktop did was it repackaged all these components, which they now call Power BI Desktop, okay? But it is very important to understand that they were all already there. So the obvious question that I, I sometimes face from candidates is, you know, why did Power BI build a tool like that? You know, why, why did I build a tool like that? If Excel had already had this component, then why not use Excel? And the challenge was that, and this is, I'm sure most of you who have actually worked in these tools would have faced similar challenges, is in Excel, you have so many different versions, you know, if you, especially if you use a 2013, 2010 version, 2016 version, and within each version, there are so many different editions. And then the other thing is that these add-in tools are not exactly part of Excel. There are different releases you have to separately add them you have to install updates so all those challenges are there so if you're migrating if you're moving from one edition to another edition the compatibility issues crop up so all those problems used to happen with this particular stack in fact as i told you and as i'll show you in in some of the upcoming discussions that all these components the behavior of these components are exactly the same when you compare the excel bi components and when you compare the power bi components that is the power bi desktop components they are exactly the same there is no difference at all okay barring a few very very minute differences they borrow most of the features right however as i said the idea of using the power bi desktop was to package it in one single solution tool and present it to end users which is just much neater it's just much easier to use it's and overall it's a just a good solution it's just a clean solution that microsoft has built okay so again coming to the question it's very important that you mention about excel bi because most people will actually go back and say okay microsoft self-service bi to solution will only be power bi which is obviously that's power bi interview so you'll actually say only power bi but actually it's no so you should mention that it actually came from excel and excel by the way is also a very very powerful self-service bi solution because remember even without the power bi components of excel even without these excel components like power query power view or power pivot Think of a very, very simple use case where you have a simple spreadsheet application. A business manager has a very, very simple spreadsheet application and he has some data on an Excel spreadsheet and all he wants to do is create a very, very simple chart out of it. Can he not use the charts function in Excel? Answer is yes, right? All he will do is he will connect to his Excel data. He can simply create either a pivot table or he can create a pivot chart and he can analyze that particular data right within Excel. And I'm not even talking about Power Query, Power Pivot and Power View. I'm talking about simply creating pivot tables and pivot charts in Excel, which you can do without using any of these components, right? And when I mentioned about that particular use case, what the business manager is actually doing is that business manager is actually performing self-service BI, right? He's performing self-service BI right within Excel, okay? on what is power bi desktop obviously power bi desktop is the free desktop application and uh, typically this question can sound a very very generic question and they just want to test out your overall understanding of the tool that we are obviously going to do much of our development in which is the power bi desktop tool so it is very important to a few keywords are very very important one is obviously it is a desktop application one other keyword that i would really like all of you to use is the client tool it is a client tool okay remember power bi the entire architecture of power bi is a client server architecture where you have the power bi desktop which is sitting in the middle as a client tool so power bi desktop is where you actually do all your development stuff 
okay that is where you actually build your reports you actually build all the cool visuals you actually build your model right inside power bi desktop and then you publish it onto the cloud which we call the power bi service so remember it's a client server architecture so mention those words mention those keywords mention those terms and uh, the other thing that you should also mention is and again as i said when asked a question on what is power bi desktop just focus a bit on the entire architecture generally okay so they may want to know what is a desktop but if you talk about the service that just goes to show that you're overall having a pretty good breadth of knowledge and just just give them a picture just give them a picture don't mention about all the components but just mention about what is the desktop and and the service at least mention about the desktop and the service generally okay and i think this is also a very very key part the second point where we are saying that power bi desktop works cohesively with the power bi service and and as i mentioned here just just mention the part that this is the client and it's the server essentially okay what are the power bi components and this is again a very very important question and it's more of a follow up to this initial question so sometimes they might want to ask a more specific question like what is power bi desktop and remember when i when i asked this question you should focus on desktop and the service but now this is a much more broad based question where they want to know your detailed knowledge on power bi what do you understand about the entire ecosystem of power bi and this is what the complete architecture is all about right you can see that it consists of power query power pivot power view these are obviously the add in components okay these are the uh, the power components then you have power map data management gateway power bi q and a is another revolutionary feature natural language querying which i'll just talk about in a while and finally power bi service okay so mainly theoretical what i would suggest is just give them a picture just give them the names of these eight components and just give them an idea of what each of these components mean okay so if asked a question like this just focus on power bi again when asked a question like this uh, just focus on power bi give a very very brief description about power bi probably just you can just probably mention power bi is a self service bi tool and it has obviously the these are the main components you have the power query power pivot power view and all these three are part of power bi desktop so all these three you can you can just club it as part of power bi desktop and then your power map which also is a part of power bi desktop and then finally your data catalog management gateway power bi q and a and power bi service which are obviously the service components okay obviously there are a few things which keep changing in the overall ecosystem so uh, remember one thing you have to understand in power bi is that the product is very very frequently updated so for instance the power bi desktop gets updated every month so every month power bi desktop it shoots out releases every month and the power bi service which obviously lives on the cloud that shoots out updates like every week or probably multiple times a week okay the new features getting added every single time and the reason why i mentioned this is because of the q and a feature remember q and a feature for a long time has been on the service and i just mentioned a while back the q and a feature is in the service it is still in the service but then in the desktop it has very recently been included as a preview feature okay so when you talk about these things if you have an understanding of what are the recent updates you know what are the recent releases that are coming from the power bi stack if you keep yourself updated with what is the january updates what are the december updates and if you understand this the length and breadth of everything that's happening in the power bi landscape i think that will just add more value to your responses and the answers to the question that you give so just as an example for this particular question if you are talking about power bi q and a one thing i will recommend is just mention that it's a service component but also mention that off late power bi has included that as part of the power bi desktop okay so now you can actually go to power bi desktop and you can shoot q and a features directly from there and i know i haven't talked a lot about this yet but i'll just quickly connect to my data here in power bi and as you can see i'm just connect this is my power bi desktop interface that i've opened okay and i can very easily connect to my excel file see how easy it is to connect to an excel file here from power bi desktop directly and i will very easily connect to my excel file from here i'll just load this data and now you get a very simple interface from where i can choose the sheet names so this is an excel workbook where i have three worksheets orders people and returns i'll select the order sheet okay the edit is basically for opening up the query editor if you open up if you click on edit it will open up the query editor where you can edit your queries okay and this is basically what you're going to get you're going to get data in your power pivot model and now you can go back and visualize your data okay so if i want to so remember the example of that fund manager where the fund manager wants to see how much profit he has got which based on every day you can see how easily just with three clicks he can generate a very very nice line chart okay and you can see how easily we can build dashboards in power bi okay and how powerful it is as a self service bi tool okay and just to come back to the question on q and a feature and by the way the preview features are turned on in power bi desktop in this particular thing you can go to file options and settings go to options and you can see all the preview features will be listed out here go to preview features and you can see all the preview features listed out here you can see i have turned on all the features except for spanish because i don't know spanish so i can't turn this on right all right so these are all the preview features and if you just double click on it see something called uh, q and a is listed out here and you can just double click on this particular thing and you should be able to see that a very very familiar q and a feature which comes up in the service that exact same thing is now built into the desktop okay and i will talk more about the service later on guys but just to bring this up as an answer to this question i just wanted to quickly cover this with all of you 
so you can just double click on this and you can ask questions you can ask some question like you know sales by region pretty cool huh? I'm just typing it and if I want to see it as a pie chart I can just say as a pie chart okay so just by typing I can see exactly what I want to look at and it gives you gives you some suggestions it's more of a, it gives you some suggestions here as you as and when you type the values and you can see if I look at the matrix want to see this as a different kind of visual let's say as a as a table it gives me all these options okay so that's the Q&A feature that is built right inside the Power BI desktop as a preview feature. And uh, when you answer this question, the other important thing that I do want to mention here is just giving a brief description about all these components. Remember guys, Power Query is the ETL component of Power BI desktop. So that's an ETL component. So the idea in Power Query is you're taking your data, you're connecting to various sources, and you're performing a very, very basic ETL operation there inside Power Query, right? So the idea is to just perform basic data cleansing operations because remember data from the source is never in the right shape. It's never in the right format, okay? It's, it's what we call dirty data. So data from the source is always dirty. So you want to always clean it, okay? You want to always clean it. You want to perform some basic transformations before you use it for your actual analysis, okay? So that is the very, very first step in Power Query. Okay, so if you remember what I've done as the very first step in Power BI is I connected to my Excel file, right? And typically uh, the way to open up query editor is either you can click on edit queries here or you could have clicked on edit in that particular dialog box I got just a while back. You could have directly clicked on edit there. Okay, so click on edit queries here. And once you do that, it will open up the query editor where you can go ahead and edit your query. Okay, you can go ahead and perform basic ETL operations. Obviously, there's a lot that is here. We're not going to cover everything, but at a basic level, this is just to just for you to understand. Uh, just to give you some context as to what this interface is all about okay and just a simple example you can probably give some simple examples here where let's say you want to uh, you're looking at the orders table and you don't want to look at all this data so you were removing some columns uh, let's say here you can record and remove all these columns you don't need all these columns so you want to remove the ship date so you don't care about ship date you don't care about customer id and see whenever i perform any kind of operation here whether it's a remove column or if i do an add column you know, just here I can also go back and do an add column so I can actually just come back here and I can add a column I can add a custom column. It's just like adding a calculated column. Okay, so I can add a column called uh, cost and cost is going to be equal to sales minus profit Okay, and that gets added as a calculated column and that again gets added as a step So everything in a query is basically a step. Okay, so mention these keywords that you build queries query editor and behind the scenes you're creating steps so mention these pieces when you're talking about this particular answer and also mention data types very very important part setting data types properly okay you can see what's happening here is when i build that particular column called cost so this becomes loosely typed it's not exactly in the correctly typed format okay abc123 basically means that it's not properly typed so you have to go back and specifically set the type to decimal number okay these are all the data types that are available in power bi desktop and so that's it. That's all I have. And what I will do now is once I'm happy with whatever changes I've done, let's say I've performed all my data cleansing and data transformation activities, I can go back and close and apply. And once I do that, what will happen is data will get loaded into my Power Pivot data model. You can see what happens here. It is get, going to get loaded into my Power Pivot data model. Okay. So the first step is Power Query, where you will perform the ETL. And the next step is from Power Query, the data goes to Power Pivot. And Power Pivot is nothing but an in memory columnar database where your data gets loaded. Okay. That's your data model. In other words, we call it a data model. So the idea is that. You perform your ETL, you clean your data, and then you load your data into the Power Pivot model. Okay, and from there, you're going to visualize your data using Power View. Okay, that's the very, very basic process that we have in the Power BI desktop. The same as we have in Excel. Okay, if even if you use the Excel BI components, it'll pretty much be the same thing. And just to give you a brief glimpse of that, I'll not talk a lot about it. I've opened up my Excel. Remember, I have opened up my Excel, but I also have the add in components loaded. So uh, I'm using 2016 version of Excel by the way, so it's very very easy to do the same thing in Excel as well So you can go to get data you can go to file you can see the interface is very similar to uh, what you have in power BI desktop And uh, which is why I actually drawn those parallels in the beginning of our discussion where I said that uh, both these components uh, draw so much from each other Okay, I'll connect with that same Excel file here Click on import. It's connecting. I'll get the same interface where I can connect to that particular worksheet from that workbook It is still establishing a connection the same interface a very very similar kind of interface opens up just a while back what we saw in power bi desktop it is taking a bit of time to load and the idea is that uh, the idea behind showing you this thing is just so that you're mentioning these things when you're asked this question so that you get an idea that okay the same thing you can do in excel as well what you can do in power bi desktop i'll just quickly go ahead and expand it I'll select my orders table from here and you can see the very very similar options are coming up load edit it will open up the query editor very similarly how it opened up in my uh, power bi desktop okay so you can processing my queries the concept of queries is very similar to what we saw in the, in the desktop and you can see it's opening up the query editor and again here you can see that it, it the interface is very very similar to what we saw in power bi desktop remember 
uh, it's very easy to confuse that I'm actually opening up Excel, uh, but this is actually Excel. It's not Power BI Desktop. Okay, so I can do the same stuff I performed just a while back in Power BI Desktop. I can go back and remove my columns. I can remove my order date, a row ID. See the steps are getting added. I can add the custom column. Go to Add Column, Custom Column. I can do pretty much the same stuff here. Okay, I can add that Cost Column, which is going to be Sales minus Profit. Click on OK. Custom Column added, and now we can go back to Home and say Close and Load too. Okay, and when you're closing and loading, essentially what happens is you're loading that whole stuff into your model. Okay. And which is nothing but the power pivot all right so it's very very important that you have this understanding that power bi desktop is not to be learned in isolation it's not to be learned in isolation but you have an you should have an appreciation of the fact that uh, behind the scenes is nothing but excel in action okay so when you mention whenever you're asked any kind of questions on the entire architecture of power bi or the components of power bi it is very very important that you link it to excel and you give them a very very concise and holistic answer of what you can do in power bi desktop and what you can do in excel and how similar they are overall okay so that's about Power Query, Power View, Power Pivot, and Power Map. Power Map is another add-in component in Excel, and essentially Power Maps are leveraged pretty much the same way within Power BI Desktop as well, using the, the very very powerful mapping feature here that you have. Okay, you can do build some very very cool maps directly from the Power BI Desktop. Okay, and essentially you can do some pretty cool stuff in the Power Maps feature as well that you have within the Excel add-ins. Okay. Uh, we have data catalog data catalog is basically azure data catalog so it's pretty helpful for connecting to different sources management of different sources your data management gateway which is used for connecting to on-premises data another very very essential component with something that you set up in the service level so if you go to the power bi service basically so whatever you see i have right now is what i call the power bi service so remember guys i talked about this in the initial session beginning of the session where i said this is my client development tool okay this is power bi desktop is a client development tool this is where i build my stuff and after I build my stuff, I publish it onto what I call the service. And just to give you a quick demonstration of that, just to give you a very, very quick demonstration of that, I'll build my build a very, very simple line chart here. And I'll just go ahead and, and, and name this as uh, I'll just give it a name. Okay, probably I'll, I'll go ahead and name it as demo. I'll save it and I'll call it demo. That's my demo Power BI report. Remember, the Power BI reports get saved with the file name extension of PBIX. That's another very important interview question. They tend to ask you what are the different extension types, and it's not only with Power BI files. They actually uh, something called template files also, which I call Power BI template file. This PBIT. Remember, these two types of extensions. PBIX stands for the Power BI file. That is the Power BI analysis file, and PBIT, which stands for the Power BI template file. Okay. So I'll save it with the name demo. Click on save. Remember, to for publishing, it is very important that you're signed in. And once you're signed in, once everything else is set up, you can just go back and save it in your workspace. And once you have done that, you can just go to the service and check that your stuff has been published. Okay, like something very similar will be visible on your service, and you can look at the report section where you can see that has been published. This respective report has been published. And remember, this is the cloud environment. Okay, so this is my development tool. That's my development environment. That's my client, and this is the cloud environment, which is my server. Okay, I published my stuff here, and now all my end users can view my reports and dashboards from here. Okay. So from here I can further create what I call dashboards and then I can go to my dashboard and say share my dashboard I can go to share and then I'll mention with whom all I want to share my dashboard and give the email IDs of all the folks I want to share my dashboards with one very important thing to remember that is power bi you can only share stuff with everyone in your organization so for instance if you look at this link this is where you can simply go ahead and specifically give access to who all you want to share it with just try start typing the email addresses that you want to send them and automatically they'll receive email notifications or you can or they will basically get notifications on their power bi service interface which is basically the tab here it's a notifications tab that you basically have here okay so very easy very simple very intuitive process overall and just mention that mention these pieces when you're when you're talking about it and again it just goes to show the overall depth of knowledge that you have in the tool if you mention all these different components taken together while you answer these questions okay what are the sources that power bi can connect to uh, actually there is uh, infinite okay so ideally there are a lot of sources power bi can connect to if you go to get data this is only from the desktop okay from the desktop it can connect to a wide range of sources so you can go to more you can just take a look at the available sources that power bi can connect to we saw an example with excel but you can connect to files xml json databases ton of databases that you have okay and if you don't see anything here you can obviously set up an odbc connection very easy to set up an odbc connection also and online services you know this list this list just keeps keeps growing azure services and it's pretty cool list of services and sources and connect to okay another very interesting option is web data just to give an example on this you can very easily connect to web data and i'll take an example of money control okay probably we can go online and i'll search for the website money control okay and this is again to highlight to you how easy it is to connect to web data in power bi 
Okay, so typically it might involve writing a lot of scripts. If you just want to quickly connect to a website and take some tabular data from there, so you can skip all the scripting, all that stuff, and just connect to the data generally. Okay, so I'll go ahead and uh, copy that link and paste it. Click on OK. And once you do that, it will try to establish a connection with Money Control. It does take a bit of time initially to set this up. And once it does, what it will do is it will go to the website and it will try to look at the website and remember everything's underlying based on HTML. So it will try to search for tables, anything which is structured as a table. It will try to search for that kind of data. And once it finds it, it will present to you a list of all those available tables. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just type this in once again. So right here is it does take some time depending on the connection that you have. So I think the site is not working that well right now. So what it's doing is it's establishing a live connection with that site at this moment. And it will ideally typically present to you a list of all the tables, table or structures that you have. And you can see it takes a bit of time to connect to the site. And as you can see, finally, my list has come up. The initial case, there was some issue with the connection. So we were not getting all the tables. And as you can see, very nicely, it will present to me all the tables. So it basically looks at that entire website and will scrape that entire website for any HTML structures that it finds. And you can see very nicely, I get this bonds here. And what is this bonds? If I just have to quickly go back and show you in money control, I've actually closed that website here. If I just have to show you quickly what that bonds is. So there's a section in that website where I have something very similar to this. And you can see how easily I am able to get a very nice tabular format out of all this. You can go to web view where you get that website kind of view, or you can directly select your data from here. You can just click on bonds and you can just go ahead and load this table directly into your website, uh, into your Power BI desktop file. Okay. It is loading. It further takes some time because remember it is taking the data straight from your website. So it does take a bit of time. Just that's why money control site is opened up here. And if you just go down, you can just take a look at this whole piece here. That's the bond section that got loaded. Okay. So very easy, nicely, you can see these are tabular structures, you know, the indexes, global markets. Okay. You have a section on bonds, you have a section on currencies, and Power BI, when it looks at that web data, it is able to very easily scrape through that data. It's very easily able to select that data from here because at the underlying layer, these are all HTML tables. Okay. So mention some of those examples when you talk about this particular question of what it can connect to. It can connect to a wide variety of sources, and that is only in the desktop. If you talk about the service, you can go to get data in the service. Okay. And you have a further lots of services you can connect to from here. So just as an example, you can choose content packs. You can obviously connect on to content packs, which are nothing but pre-built and pre-packaged dashboards, we like to call it. Okay. In other words, another name for content packs is what we call apps. So nowadays, uh, apps are a replacement for content packs. You can think of it, and, and they are nothing but pre-packaged. Uh, it's like packaged dashboards, it's like packages. Okay. You know where you have already built a dashboard, where you have already built in the reports, the data sets, the dashboards, the model, everything, and the end users just consuming it. As an example, what I really like to show you here is uh, something with Bitcoin. Okay, so something with uh, Bing Maps as an example. So let's let's look at Bing Maps. Let's see if I can find Bing Maps here. Yeah, I have Bing Maps here. So what I can do is I can just get it now. It is just like installing an app from Google Play Store or just installing an app. Okay, and you can see what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to consume that app. Okay, it's like a prepackaged stuff. All the data sets, everything is built in, and I have to enter a parameter. So Microsoft is asking me for a parameter. So I'll just type in Bitcoin just to see what is the search activity in Bitcoin. And just for those of you who don't know, Bing is a search engine by Microsoft. Okay, it's a search engine just like Google. Click on add, and you can see automatically that dashboard got added. I didn't create it, but that is something that got automatically created. Okay, and that's the reason why I say these are content packs, which are nothing but prepackaged dashboards which are already built in. And now you can actually see that how people are searching from where people are searching the most and obviously US people are searching for Bitcoin the most. Okay, see some news mentioned here. Okay, and top languages. Interestingly, German and French are also pretty high. Okay, see the change week over week change. How many more people are viewing and you also get a pretty good line chart here where it actually shows you the activity. Okay, the activity is the last week and pretty interesting. I mean, on this particular day, there was a big spike. You can see that 24,037 people actually searched for it. And uh, you know, slowly, gradually, people have lost interest. It, it seems like okay, not many people are actually viewing it now. So, anyways, the idea is to just uh, highlight that there is something called content packs. And remember, there are two places where you can connect to data. One is from the, from the desktop, and the other is from the service. Okay, from the service, also you get a very robust set of options to connect to data, where you not only can connect to files, databases, you can connect to files from here, OneDrive, local files, connect to databases, Azure databases, and you can also connect onto services. And further, you can also connect onto your organizational content packs if you're working for an organization and uh, you can also connect on to any organizational content packs that people in your organization have developed okay so services are basically content packs from online services typical online services like bing salesforce and all that okay but then organization is only specific to your organization so mention this piece as well when you talk about the sources you can connect to
what are the building blocks of power bi i believe this is something i've already talked quite a lot about but when you ask this question again as i said uh, mention give a very very broad based view of the building blocks and i think i'll really appreciate if you're answering this question as an interviewer definitely they'll appreciate it if you're giving them a holistic view of the entire architecture right so talk about power query talk a little bit about excel talk about those main components which we call power query power pivot power and power view talk about those components and then come to the building blocks the building blocks obviously are the data sets the visualizations the dashboards the tiles which are some of the most fundamental things that you have in uh, power bi and just to just to give you a, a brief context about what, what this stuff is so when you build your stuff in power bi desktop obviously you're working with three pr main tabs primarily that is the obviously the query editor is where you did your etl you loaded your data into the model and then you come to the data tab data tab is where you can actually view your model tables okay so right now i have only two tables one is the orders table and one is the bonds table so you can actually view your tables over at the data tab the relationships tab is again where you can quickly take a look at your underlying table relationships and finally the reports tab is where you can take a look at your report whatever reports you're building okay and once you publish this stuff then you come to the service and the service you basically have data sets obviously the underlying model and data along with that which you've exported out or published to the service that's your data sets the reports folder and from the reports you build dashboards those the dashboards folder and also have a component called workbooks which you can mention and in dashboards you further have what we call tiles okay these are called tiles in a dashboard okay as you can see these are all tiles okay so for instance here i have created only a single line chart right if you look at this particular thing that i published i created only a single line chart now i can opt to add one more visual to my report so what i can do is i can look at my report here and another beautiful thing about the service and again something that all of you can mention here is the editing capabilities in the service that power bi gives you so you can edit a report straight within the service so the amazing feature where you get a very very desktop like interface right within the service remember however when you mention this part do mention that you can't build models and you can't do query editing within the service you can only edit reports okay so you can only edit reports and you can only work on the visualization layer within the service right and here i can opt to build a, a bar chart where i can look at sales in category wise let's say i want to stack this by a segment and i can do that and you can see how automatically power bi is able to fit these things into the respective components and again the it just goes to show the ssbi capabilities the self-service bi capabilities of power bi so if a novice user if a business user is working on it and they have absolutely no clue you know what to put which where to put which component you know they can simply click on the fields and power bi will automatically put them in the respective sections okay this again goes to show the self-service capabilities of power bi and i can create multiple pages of course okay i can create another page where i can build a simple tree map here where i'm showing the categories of category and i'm showing the profits now and I can build a very simple tree map here. And if I want to saturate it with colors, I can further add some color saturations. Okay. I can further add some color saturation. Let's say I want to saturate this by uh, sales. I can further saturate this by colors. Okay. And now I can go back and, and, and remember this the report that I've edited. So I need to go back and save it. So I need to go back and save this report. And once I do that, it will be directly saved within the service itself. Okay. It will be saved in the service itself. Now, one of the questions that people might ask you at times is uh, they might ask you that, can I? So now that I've edited the report in the service, can I go ahead and download the report? And answer is absolutely yes. And again, remember it's a preview feature. Uh, previously, this was not there. It, this feature got included after a lot of requests by users. It was a major roadblock uh, generally in the development process, but it's a very, very useful option that you have here. And now that you have saved the report, you can actually go ahead and download a copy of the report in the in your local machine. Okay, very useful feature. You can download it here. You can also export this to PowerPoint preview. Another very useful feature that you have in the service. You can actually export it to a PowerPoint. Okay, so remember it won't be as interactive. It won't be an interactive presentation, obviously, but you'll still get a pretty cool view of you know an introductory page will be created and the visuals will be there. So it's a pretty decent kind of interface that you will get. So that's another feature that you actually get in the service and once you have built that report you can go back and obviously pin that to your existing dashboard so my dashboard is going to be demo dashboard which i built and now in my existing dashboard of demo if you remember i now have two visuals okay it says power bi is ready to download and now you can see these are, the, these are the tiles that i have basically okay so hope you all follow this particular discussion uh, where i talked about what are the building blocks in power bi obviously you'll mention a bit about the components and then you will talk a little bit about what are the primary building blocks which are obviously data sets visuals reports dashboards and tiles okay data sets visuals using visuals you create reports using reports you create dashboards and basically uh, using dashboards essentially the tiles are part of the dashboards using reports you basically create tiles and using tiles you create dashboards okay what are the different types of filters in power bi reports visual filters page level filters report level filters and drill through filters now the very very important question so typically the way to answer this question is to go back and take scenarios now what are the scenarios where you will implement each type of filter 
so visual level filters obviously is present only at the visual level so it is only you can think of it like a report level filter it's present only in a particular type of report a particular type of chart okay so when you come back here and come back to the desktop and if you, if you take a look at it you will see that line chart that i built here go to the filters panel and you can see all the visual level filters are applied by default okay and these are going to be by default all the fields that are already a part of the report okay so these are so if you place another chart here if you place a bar chart here for instance so whatever you do in that line chart will not affect that bar chart okay so if i take a bar chart here and i say region wise sales and now if i go ahead and filter that region so remember if i click on the region filter here i will have a region filter here for the bar chart and if i go ahead and change that region filter to central it will not affect the line chart because as i said it's a visual level filter so visual level filters are in short they are uh, specific only to the visual then i have page level filters i can go back and drag and drop that region now in the page level filters and now if i go back and change central if i filter into central both will be affected okay make it east both will be affected okay so that's why we call it a page level filter all the reports within the same page will be filtered okay then i can have something but remember if i have a report in a different page it will not be filtered so in a different page if i go back and place a uh, region and sales see how it will not be filtered okay so although i am filtering by central and east here in the page 2 i am not filtering by central and east because that's a page level filter okay finally if you want to implement that you can implement something called a report level filter okay i can remove the page level filter and then i can take the region in the report level filter which means that all the pages in that report will basically have that filter and here i can go back and include central and west and see in the first page obviously it will be filtered but because the report level filter if you go to the second page also you will see that in this particular section it will be highlighted okay it will also be filtered here and report level filter will appear in, in this page also if i get the third page it will be here fourth page it will be here so that is what we call a report level filter okay and finally we call it a drill through feature which you can use a drill through filter to basically uh, work on drill through reports so what you can do is let's say you have a scenario where you have categories so instead of region if I, let's say if i have categories here and i can build another use case in page two let's say i have a scenario where i have subcategories okay so here i'm having subcategories and categories of course let's say i have categories subcategories and i'm looking at category and subcategory by sales okay very simple report type i'm looking at it's a detailed view i'm looking at so i can configure a drill through filter so the idea is that if i, if I right click on my a particular category i should be able to see subcategories of only that particular category so in that particular case i can go back and configure drill through filter okay and again you can mention where let's say the use case could be that if i want to click on a particular report i want to navigate to another page and i want to see subcategories in that particular page those are scenarios where you will basically go ahead and configure drill through reports well uh, one other thing that i must mention to all of you here is uh, there'll be certain use case there'll be certain scenarios where people will i mean i did mention the clause drill through reports remember okay just to quickly mention uh, how again but just to clarify how you configure it remember one thing you must must remember is the filter is something that you don't place here okay the filter should always be placed in the page where you're configuring it so if you're configuring this page the category filter should be placed here okay remember i'm filtering by category right what am i trying to do i'll click on a category here and based on that i'll select a subcategory here so the idea is that you're going to filter on the category in this particular page so you should always place category in the drill through section in this particular page and now when you go to page one and if you right click on that technology you will see an option for drill through okay you will see an option for drill through to page two and when you do that you will see only technology getting filtered and once that happens you will automatically see that in the drill through filter section category technology is automatically filtered remember guys it's a very recent inclusion it's not exactly a again real true filters typically was not part of the filters panel even a few months back okay this again came very recently and it's again a very new feature but it's always a very very useful feature because drill through reports is something that if you have worked across other tools enterprise reporting tools it's a very common feature where you click on a particular item and you want to go to another page where you're filtered with that particular item okay and this is a very very useful case right it's a very very useful scenario where it enables you to do that right so you can not only configure stuff in uh, in one page but you can actually configure stuff in another page another very common scenario another very common use case for this could be that there could be initial introduction page right the initial introduction page could be like you know you're, you're showing the categories right you're showing all category related information so you're showing technology and you're basically showing all the all, all the categories right the categories are furniture office supplies technology so everything about the categories you're showing and then your page two and the page two will actually consist of everything about the subcategories right it, it is the subcategory page it is a subcategory page for the category that you have selected and page three could be the product page for the product that you have selected from that subcategory essentially from the subcategory that you've selected okay so i can further build another page i can further build another page and guys remember this need not be a table okay this could be anything else this could also and by the way you need not need to, you don't need to have category also this could be anything else this could be this could even be a bar chart 
Okay, I'm just giving a table as an example, but this could be any kind of visual. It could be one visual. It could be multiple visuals. You could also have a pie chart here. Okay, I can do a control C, control V. I can build a pie chart here, and you could build any kind of visual. But remember, the concept is that whatever subcategories you see, so I'll call this a subcategory page, and that is basically my initial category page. And I can further build one more page called the product page. And the product page is where I'll probably have some detailed information. Or probably I can build a bar chart here also, where I'll get my product IDs. I mean by product names in the values axis the sales probably go back and uh, sort this data sort by sales so i'm showing my high, highest sales up on top okay and here i'm going to go ahead and sort this information by subcategory so i can go back and sort this by subcategory so what i'll do is i'll take the subcategory and put it in the drill through filters here okay so now remember category this page i have no filters so because that's my main page then nothing should be applied everything about my categories in the subcategory page where I have everything about my subcategory here. Obviously, I've selected a category so that is filtered out, but then further I can go back and select my product from here. Okay, so the idea is that you will navigate from here. So you want to go to drill through you want to go to subcategory. Okay, so I'm looking at a particular category. I want to know more about that category. So go to subcategory. Show me more about furniture. Now, whatever you're seeing right now is about furniture, right? You're seeing all the uh, you know all the top subcategories in furniture. You're seeing all the top subcategories in furniture. Now, okay, interestingly, you see furnishings are not done well at well. Okay, so furnishings is kind of a laggard. You want to see what's happening in furnishings. So you want to click, click on that, and now you want to go to drill through in product. You want to see all the products of that particular subcategory, and that's how you get to see all the products of that particular subcategory. Okay, so that's the idea of drill through filters. Again, it's a very very important concept, very very powerful feature in Power BI, and it's very important that you mention that. Okay. So those are the main types of filters that you have in Power BI Desktop. Content packs and apps, I think I covered that already. So just skip to that right now. DAX, very, very important part, guys. And obviously, DAX is a functional language, very important piece in the overall Power BI Desktop stack. Remember, in Power BI, whenever you talk about Power BI, and something that you guys will anyways mention when you talk about the components, obviously, you, you guys talked about Power Query. There was an instance where I actually wrote a custom column. I actually added a custom column a while back. Okay. Remember that cost column I added where I write a very simple expression called sales minus profit. So the language behind the scenes that's being written is called M code. Okay, so it's called M code. So Power Query is equivalent to M, whereas Power Pivot is equivalent to DAX. Okay, the underlying language that you use in Power Pivot is DAX, whereas the underlying language that you write in Power Query is essentially called M. And just to give you a, a very very brief flavor of M, what it is, and if you go to edit queries here, uh, remember all these queries are nothing but a combination of steps. And if you want to look at just a brief idea of what is M, go to View, go to Advanced Editor, and you can take a look at the M query syntax here. Okay, that's the M query syntax that that is highlighted for you here. So remember, this is existing in Query Editor, whereas Power Pivot is something DAX is something that exists in Power Pivot. So where do you see DAX? You can go to the Modeling tab, or you can just enter the modeling from here. You can go to New Column, and you can just start typing in your DAX queries here. Okay, we'll look at more about some of these examples just in a bit, but this is where you actually start typing in DAX. Okay, at a very simple level, I can say sum of sales. I'm creating a very, very simple calculated column here, and that is how you basically build DAX queries. Okay, I'll go back and just delete it. So, very important, guys, when you asked about DAX, it could be a very generic question, but uh, it's very important just to not be theoretical. It's very important that you mention a couple of things like it's a functional language and give some examples of how DAX is related to stuff that you can do in the Power Pivot, that is in the data model, and essentially it helps you add more meaning to your data because your underlying data could be in a certain format, but there are certain kinds of calculations, a certain kind of complex measures that you want to add, uh, which could only be done in the Power Pivot layer and nowhere else. Okay, and we look at some examples of this just in a bit of certain things that you can do only in the Power Pivot layer and nowhere else. You can't do that stuff in the ETL layer. Okay, might sound surprising, but I'll just show you some examples of, of why that is the case. Okay, these are some of the common DAX functions, and again, this kind of goes hand in hand with the ninth question. So when you're asked about DAX, just mention some of the functions. Again, this goes to show. The length and breadth of your overall knowledge of DAX because any kind of job interviews on Power BI, DAX is an integral component because people expect you to be good in DAX, right? Because it's, it's not all about the visualization layer, it's not all about point and click. Click on a visual, you get a visual uh, knowing the underlying features, which is fine, but people do expect you to understand the, the DAX queries very, very well. And not only DAX, even at some level, the M query language also you need to be good at. At least, at least have a basic understanding so that if there are errors, you want to do some debugging, at least you're able to pinpoint on, on those issues. Okay, filter function it goes hand in hand with calculate basically and this is again a very very important component in power bi desktop and something that you will use a lot and you know whether you know any other function or not this is one function that you have to know and have to understand okay and calculate function basically operates in the filter context i'll just briefly explain to you what this is and uh, what are some of the use cases behind using it so what i will do here is i'll create a very simple table 
so what i have here is a is an example where let's say i have year okay so i have year information i'll take order date and i'll take sales information okay so i'm, I'm seeing a bar chart i'll convert this to a table and right now what you're seeing is a very nice tabular information right now what i want to know is a percentage okay so let's say the scenario is that i need to know okay right now what i'm seeing is the total sales across the total absolute value of sales right but what if i want to quickly figure out the percentage of the total so for instance right now you're looking at quarter wise or maybe another good example will be taking subcategory instead of taking order let's take subcategory okay so right now what you're seeing is sales across different subcategories but what if you want to know what is the total percentage of paper sales compared to the total so right now you're seeing absolute values how do you convert it to a percentage and the way to do that is using a calculate function okay so you can't just divide this by total so i mean conceptually is very easy right so you'll take this number you will divide by this so you will take 107532 you will divide by this okay just to expand it go to the focus mode now i hope you can see other numbers correctly now so 203412.73 divided by 2297 so you're dividing each of the row values by the total at every step of the process right to calculate the percentage okay and that is something you can do using the calculate function you have to build a dax calculated column here okay there are some lot of cool ways of doing it and uh, again there are some pretty cool ways of doing it manually without creating dax so you can go to show value as and you can actually say percent of grand total so this is the easy way of building it but remember even when you're doing this behind the scenes power bi is implementing the dax for you okay there is also another revolutionary feature called measures so again there are some lot of new things that you have in power bi is something called quick measures that you can also implement but again remember whenever you're doing any of this stuff uh, behind the scenes you are implementing uh, dax okay you have some new quick measures if i go to new quick measures i will see a ton of stuff that i can build in power bi okay you can just take a look at this now and you can see a ton of stuff that you, that you can do here okay and again there are a lot of these things tend to be added from time to time new things can to be released you can see time intelligence calculations totals running totals uh, star rating really cool thing you know star rating it's an amazing feature so you can actually give a star rating highest value let's say my highest value is going to be something like 250000 i'll probably say okay that's my highest value that's my lowest value so i can give the number of stars and i can enter a new quick measure called star rating okay and now you can see behind the scenes i've actually got dax so whatever you're seeing here right now is actually a pretty complicated version of dax okay so whenever you create quick measures or any of these default point and click options behind the scenes power bi is actually building that dax for you okay this is actually a pretty complicated bit of dax that's written and the final output is actually pretty neat okay you can see that that's my that's my star rating column i've created um and you can see that as a top value five stars here uh, four stars here one star here it's pretty relative depending on the type of data and and the best part is that it is actually going to be dynamic and what do i mean by dynamic uh, what i mean by dynamic is that this value will change depending on the underlying data so essentially if you take subcategory and if you further try to break it by region that data will actually change so now now your stars will actually adjust based on the uh, underlying granularity of your data okay and now you can see nothing is now a five star everything's like you know two stars three stars because the maximum that you mentioned is uh, no one's reaching that other than the total obviously okay so uh, what i wanted to highlight again is that behind the scenes although you can do this particular you can solve this particular problem in a very very simple manner but behind the scenes bobby i will always write a tax for you so coming back to the underlying question once again so i am looking at my individual sales values and i want to calculate the the percentage of it so if i want to write a dax formula for this the way to write it would be to go back and implement it manually using the calculated column option and i'll quickly go ahead and open up my wizard and fire in a quick bit of dax here so how do i do that i'll go to the modeling tab and i'll go to new column click on new column because that is actually going to be a sorry a new measure that's going to be a new measure and i'll just uh, in, in one of the upcoming questions i'll talk a little bit about what is a measure and what is a column okay this, this is a very very important difference by the way between the two so here is going to be a measure i'll create and the measure is going to be called let's say sales percentage i'm going to call it sales percentage and let me quickly type in the measure i'm going to take the sum of sales and i'm going to divide it by what i'm going to divide it by the calculate of the sum of sales i'm going to divide it by the calculate of the sum of sales and here i'm going to apply what what i call the filter context okay and this is this is the important part this is the key part and okay so whenever you use the calculate calculate basically has two arguments and and as you would have observed whenever you start typing uh, any kind of function in tax it has a pretty nice kind of auto completion or a help suggestion wizard that comes up it tells you that hey what are the arguments that i need to enter in calculate and it very clearly tells me that the arguments i need to enter is the expression the expression is the stuff i want to calculate which is obviously going to be sum of sales that is what i want to calculate sum of sales is the underlying expression 
and then I have to give the filter context. Okay, you have to give the filter. Okay, evaluate an expression in a context modified by the filter. And this is the important part. So remember, when I am performing this operation, I should ideally not have any filters, right? Conceptually, think about it. When I'm performing this operation, ideally, I should not have any filters. And that's exactly what you're going to set here in this particular example. So you're going to set this up in such a way that you don't have any filters. Let me go ahead and quickly set this up now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and give all. So when I say all, I'm, I'm specifically telling Power BI that, hey, no matter what filter context is applied on that particular row, you're ignoring everything. Okay. And I'm going to take all of orders. Okay. I'm going to consider all of orders and I'm just going to go ahead and close my parenthesis here. Okay. I missed closing the brackets here. Let me go ahead and quickly edit the syntax. And whenever you make an incorrect syntax, what happens is uh, it will give you this red squiggly, which will highlight that. Okay. So the syntax is not right. As you can see, that's my DAX formula right now. And just to clarify once again, calculate. The way we are using calculate is we are calculating sum of sales as the first argument and we are calculating sum of sales based on the filter context of all orders. Okay, that is where you'll, you'll mention the filter context. So you're, you're saying that I will calculate the total sales irrespective of the filters applied. So I'm taking all of orders. So you're dividing individual rows by the total. That is the underlying meaning of this. Okay, and I can actually go ahead and multiply that with 100 just to add clarity on this whole formula. So because it's a percentage, I'll just multiply that by 100 overall. And now I can go ahead and add that piece of code right into my table and see the results. Okay, as you can see, I was very easily able to achieve that using a very, very simple piece of DAX code involving calculate. Okay, so this is just one use case of how you use calculate. Very, very important DAX formula, calculate and filters, and something that gets asked all the time in interviews. Okay, and the best part about this is it's dynamic. So see how I've used subcategory here. If you want to use something else, let's say you want to use a region. You can do that as well. So I'll take a region, I'll remove the subcategory and see how that entire formula adjusts automatically depending on the kind of calculation you're using. Okay, the kind of grouping that you're doing. And you can see the region percentages are highlighted. Everything adds up to 100%. And it comes up pretty nicely overall. Okay, if you don't like region, if you want to further split it by segment, you can go ahead and split it further by segment and see how again the entire calculation gets dynamically adjusted. Okay, and this is again the beauty of measures. Okay, this is again the beauty of measures, which the, the very fact that measures are dynamic in nature. It is dynamic in nature and it will basically adjust every time you change anything in the visuals, change anything, filter anything, your measures will always recalculate. Okay, and measures are always created with a small calculator icon. Okay, what are the benefits of using variables in DAX? Uh, as I and variables in DAX are no different from variables in any other programming language. Obviously, DAX is another kind of functional language. So, variables, one of the uh, most important use cases is that. You know, it can be reused multiple times so as to avoid any kind of duplication or redundancy in your overall code, right? There are some other examples that we have on you can specify uh, what are some of the time intelligence functions again calculate is something that you can use for this. So we talked about calculate all and filter and you can obviously use them in, in multiple ways to go ahead and create n number of different use cases. Okay, this is one use case I mentioned, but you can obviously use calculate to create trading X month metrics via DAX. Okay, it's a non standard calendar for instance. Okay, and you can see what we are doing here as a second step is we are using all again to remove existing filters. Okay, remember the concept of all is you're still applying the filter context, but the only difference is in all what you're saying is you're removing all the filters. Okay, what is a calculated column in Power BI and why would you use them? And this is the part where I talk a little bit about calculated columns. And an example that I will show you guys here is related to, let's say, profit percentage. So, what I will do here is I have a measure that I created here. I'll go back and delete it. So, I have a cost column. What I will do is I'll build a calculated column. So you build calculated columns using the new column option. You build measures in the new measure option. So I can build calculated columns using this option here and column name will be profit percentage. What is the formula for profit percentage? It is going to be cost by sorry a uh, profit by sorry. Uh, I think I've selected the wrong table. Okay, so uh, yeah, so one problem that happens is and just to I think good that we got this error. So one thing that happens is uh, you know when you create the calculated column, remember that you're clicking on the right table. So basically I'm trying to create a column on this table. And I'm not able to find the profit column because obviously it doesn't exist in my bonds table. So obviously I'm trying to create a table, uh, a column in the wrong table. Okay, so I'll go back and delete that from here. So ideally the profit percentage should be created in my orders table, right? So I'll go to my orders table, just click on it once, and that should pretty much be enough to select that table and click on new column. Now click on new column, and that means that now that particular column is now. So you can see that that's now a part of my orders table. Okay, it by default comes with the column name of column, but I can absolutely go ahead and change it to something like profit percentage. And profit percentage is going to be profit. And now, as I start typing profit, you can see automatically profit will come up. Orders of profit. That's the basic syntax that is applied. So, orders is my table name, and profit is the column. So, that is profit by cost. That's my percentage of profit percent, right? So, profit by CP into 100. So, that's my calculated column. 
everything looks okay up to this point and what i will also do is additionally i'll also create a measure okay additionally i'll also create a measure conceptually there is a lot of difference but uh, syntax wise there is very little difference so what i will do is i'll create something exactly similar only difference is this time i'll call it profit percentage measure see all i've done is i've copied pasted the entire formula so that's this the measure and the only other thing that i have to do for measures is i have to aggregate it so that is the only other additional syntax difference in measures that i have to pre-aggregate my fields in measures okay because without aggregations measures have no meaning inherently so that is what i'm going to do oh sorry one small thing i have to change so 100 is basically going to come outside the sum that's my measure so what i have is a profit percentage calculated column and the profit percentage measure you can see that the difference in icons now conceptually what is the difference there is actually a lot and as an example if i show you region and if i basically want to know what is my uh, profit percentage across different regions if i just try to see the profit percentage using calculated columns look at my number is that even a valid number i mean a uh, 300000 percentage is that a total profit percent answer is wrong that is absolutely incorrect data okay so even if i want to look at this data across uh, in, in a granular level across different segments you can see it's the same problem i get very very big numbers which is which, which definitely something wrong with my data but the moment i take something like the measure if i take that measure here everything looks perfect okay things look perfect now okay the measure is giving me the right result whereas the this is giving me the wrong result and why is that so and that is basically the key difference the key conceptual difference between a calculated column and a measure okay i'll come to the performance aspect when to use what and obviously when you answer this question on measures and calculated columns performance aspect is also very important but you should always start with the conceptual difference first what is the conceptual difference what is actually happening in the model and what is actually happening in the model is when you look at the calculated column all that it is doing is it is basically summing this up it is actually aggregating all the data that is already there in my model okay in other words when you go back to the model and when you look at the orders table if you just scroll over to the right you will see that profit percentage is actually calculated and stored every for every single row in my model itself okay so whatever column you are looking at at the end here profit percentage is basically a calculated column that has been calculated for every single instance of the row okay and that is stored in my model so all that i'm doing in the table is i'm aggregating all these values together which is obviously incorrect right so essentially what it means is if i look at row number let's say if i look at row number one and two and if i look at all the 20 rows here which are all western okay essentially what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to add up all these profit percentage values for west okay it's just like doing a group by region and sum of profit percentage which is obviously incorrect okay it is obviously incorrect and if you look at my table that's exactly what i'm doing i'm actually doing a sum of profit percentage across all those rows which is actually incorrect okay so uh, that is the problem that is the key problem and that is exactly what you need to fix here okay and even if you try to do a average of profit percentage you might be wondering that okay okay so obviously if i try to do a sum of profit percentage i'll get a problem so why don't i just go back here and change this to average even by doing this you will get incorrect output okay you will get incorrect output even if you do this this is not the right way of building it okay the right way of building this is to actually do it using measures okay and that is exactly what i want to highlight here and and the other thing that you would have observed is in measures they are actually not stored in the model measures are always calculated ad hoc dynamically on the fly measures are never stored in your model okay your model calculates the value of the calculated column and it stores them on a row by row basis in the model but it never stores the value of your measures measures are always calculated dynamically on the fly okay so if you just look back at this particular example here you can see these measures are always recalculated so when i go back and remove that segment those measures are actually getting recalculated on the fly okay so i'm actually recalculating them on the fly if i just go back and take something else let's say instead of region if i just go back and take a category it's actually getting recalculated okay so that is an important thing about measures that you should keep in mind okay and that is the other reason why when you build a measure you can just see that in measures because they are not calculated on the fly because they're actually not stored in my model you have to define the aggregations here okay they are calculated dynamically based on whatever filters you apply whatever stuff you do they're always calculated dynamically okay and they are responsive to filters that is the other important thing they are responsive to filters okay so for instance if i go back and put some filters here let's say i'm looking at category and i can actually further split it by subcategories okay and now if i go back and put some filters let's say i'll go back to region and I'll, I'll put some page level filters here for region and if i if i look at for central data you will see that now they're responding to filters okay they're actually going to be responsive to filters as well generally okay and they're recalculating every time you're changing anything in your data they're recalculating based on the aggregations that you've defined okay so a couple of key things that you have to keep in mind when you talk about measures a is they are not stored in your model b is they are dynamic uh, they are always calculated on the fly dynamically as and when you're building your visuals 
and C is obviously that are particularly useful for calculating any kind of data which is pertaining to percentages or any kind anything that represents any any kind of denominator. Okay, so divisions particularly are a very very common use case where you will use measures because divisions are where calculated columns will fail all the time. Okay, imagine building something like this in your query level. Okay, you cannot do it. You cannot build a visualization like that in query layer. Okay, so, you, so for instance, if you try to perform this profit percentage calculation row by row, it will not work. Okay, it will not work. And in this kind of scenarios where you have some kind of percentages, some kind of denominator, some kind of division involved, you should always use measures. Okay. And again, measures should be used for complex calculations. And the other really, really powerful aspect of measures is that, and as we have mentioned in the slides here, as you can see that here, calculated columns are not compressed and they consume more memory. And the reason why they consume more memory is because, as I said, they're stored in the model. And this is where again measures win out. Okay. Measures win because measures are actually they're not stored anywhere. Okay, it's more dynamic. They're not stored anywhere. They take less storage. And but but the obvious disadvantage of a measure is that because they're not stored anywhere, because they're dynamic, because they're calculated ad hoc on the fly, they probably put more strain on the resources, right? So it'll probably take more time to evaluate. So as of today, the differences are hardly, you know, you'll hardly feel it. It's almost negligible because of some of the performance improvements that have taken place. But generally, they'll give roughly the same performance. But still, measures do take a little lesser time comparatively because, as I said, just put more resources. And as you can see, the last point that you mentioned is they can also reduce processing and refresh performance if applied on large fact tables and can make a model more difficult to maintain or support. Okay, given that the calculated column is not present in the source system, that is another important point you should keep in mind. Power pivot. Uh, I think we have spent a lot of time already on on power pivot, discussing the components at a very high level already. But when you asked a question on what is power pivot, it's very very important to link it with DAX. So again, it is a it is a discussion on one of the components of Power BI. So I think it will be really appreciated if you all of you could just spend like you know a minute to go over what is Power BI, talk about the self service aspect, talk a little bit about some of the components of Power BI, and then come to talk about Power Pivot. At the fact that it's the it's the modeling layer, the fact that you have that X velocity in memory column database that you're maintaining, and you know, essentially that's the layer that you actually built DAX calculate columns and DAX measures in Power BI. Okay, so mention those pieces along with that. Another thing that I wanted to mention is the data model quickly data model obviously is the model that you that you're building after after you're performing the query editing and all that stuff the place where you're loading all your stuff into is what we call data model and data model consists of tables and obviously tables are consisting of columns and rows and essentially you have relationships. Okay, these are the key aspects of a data model and just to briefly explain this whole piece to you and what I'll do here is I will be connecting to my Excel once again, and I'll just be bringing in one more table. So what I'll be doing here is I'll be quickly going ahead and connecting to my Excel and bringing in one more table called returns just to demonstrate to you guys what is a relationship and how to quickly build a relationship. And you can see it's the same process and the only difference is that I'm going to bring in these two tables people and returns together. Okay, I'm just going to directly load them. You can see processing queries and I've loaded that data into my model right now. It is loading my data. So this is a step where I'm loading my data, creating connection, loading data to model. You can see these steps. And I have to make a small change. Actually, I go to edit queries and my data is actually not in the right shape. So I need to go back to returns and there's a quick thing I'll change here. Um, I'll, I'll just go back and make this first row as headers. You can see headers are not in the first row. Very, very simple ETL operation I'm going to perform. So go back to people and convert that to first, first row as headers. I'm not really using bonds. So I'll just go back and, you know, Go back and remove bonds. So I'll just delete that bonds and close and apply this. Okay, so what I have as the end result is I have three tables. Remember in query editor, they're called queries, but the moment you load that into the model that is power pivot, we call them tables. Okay, so everything is a table now. And if you go back to the tables tab, you will see the three tables that are present here obviously, orders, people, and returns. And if you go to the relationships tab, you can actually see the relationships. Okay, so Power BI will uh, do a pretty decent job in automatically creating relationships based on column names. So if there are two similar column names, Power BI will automatically relate them, but then it will not do a very good job always. Okay. So for instance, here you can see region and region are automatically related. Just double click on the relationships tab and you can see the relationship region and region are related. You can see the types of relationships, cardinality, many to one, one to one, one to many, the typical standard relationship types. And it's an active relationship. That's something you can turn on and off. Okay. And you can also I can see but returns, it was not able to relate. Let's just go back and manually do it. Order ID, just it's as simple as a drag and drop. And now we have related it, orders and returns as well. It's very, very important to build relationships, guys. And you know, it's a, always a consideration that you have to always have to decide whether you want to keep everything in one table or you want to go back and keep things in separate tables. Uh, it's, it's always a very, very key question that you might get. So at what level do you decide should you normalize further? At what level do you decide that? So that, that's a very tricky question. And I think there's no easy answer to that, but it really depends. 
uh, just like so many other things it really depends on a lot of different scenarios because you can decide to have everything in one table so for instance if you look at this particular use case you can decide to have orders people and regions returns all in one single table okay you can just go to query editor to a merge queries you can just join all these three together and have everything in one denormalized table uh, you know things look things are good but the obvious disadvantage is that it's going to be a big table it's going to take a lot of space and that's not a good thing okay and on the on the contrary you can keep them in separate tables but the obvious problem will be that you know uh, because the relationships are there whenever you're trying to query data across you know when you try to visualize something across three different tables it's just going to take a little bit more time compared to when you're trying to do it in one table okay so there are obvious pros and cons in both approaches but it's important to understand the relationships are very very important and uh, mostly in power bi as i said you you will mostly have these normalized scenarios where you will typically have a lot of these split out tables and you will typically have to combine them with relationships okay and why is relationships important because without relationships you cannot visualize data across multiple tables so for instance you have orders here people here re uh, returns here and if you go to my visualization layer now i can opt to see sales by the and you can see sales have selected from the orders table i can go to the people table i can visualize that by person okay i can actually visualize that by person remember i have selected fields from two completely different tables and i can actually filter that whole stuff by the return status okay pretty cool isn't it and this is something i could not have done this if i have not related the tables okay so you can see the visualization that i have here i have selected fields across four three different tables and this was possible only because i've related the tables if i have not related the tables for instance if i had not related my tables if i just go back and remove the relationship here if i make them independent tables without any relationship you can see that it will give the same values at times power we will give an error like this and at times it will actually go back and say give the same value okay so that's an important thing to remember and understand exactly why relationships are required and these are some scenarios that you should actually point out when you talk about the data model and what is power pivot and when you talk more about relationships okay so the x velocity in memory analytics engine is something i talked about that's basically the underlying engine behind power pivot that's something that drives power pivot it can handle a huge amount of data because at the underlying layer it is nothing but a columnar database okay it stores data in columnar databases and uh, columnar database as some of you may know is a very special kind of database which is optimized for um, storing huge amounts of data and overall data access is very very fast in a columnar database it doesn't maintain data in a typical relational database format where you know data is stored in the form of rows and columns typically the way we understand it but columnar database is a very very special way of storing data and i'll encourage all of you to go look at it more and if you can stress a little bit more on columnar database when you talk about this particular concept just just spend a little bit of time talking what is about what is a columnar database because as i said everything about power pivot and the in memory engine of power pivot is based on columnar database so to talk about a columnar database mention a bit about what it is and if you can get into those aspects of why data is fast why access is fast nothing like it but it's not required and that's getting too much the advanced aspects but that's not required but it's an optional thing that you can take a call on our relationships obviously uh, there's an option that you can set you can either have uh, one active relationship you can have multiple active relationships uh, obviously if you go to the relationship types here uh, one one very very common use case of this will be order dates the date the date thing okay you can have order date uh, ship date due date and and a very very common use case of this is especially if you are dealing with role playing dimensions and this is a very very common scenario that you should mention role playing dimensions is a term that you should mention where you can only have one active relationship okay very important that you mention that guys uh, with role playing dimension you can only have one active relationship okay and how do you make a relationship inactive so we talked about that already let's say region and region related here it's a solid line you can actually double click on that and you can make that relationship inactive click on okay and that is an inactive relationship power query i think you spent a lot of time on this already so uh, needless to say when you talk about power query mention a couple of key terms etl tool shaping cleansing transforming data very very important pieces and also mention the m query bit that every query is a combination of steps and you can build multiple queries and ultimately the underlying layer you're writing m code okay query folding is actually another very very important feature in power bi and obviously it's more of a performance enhancement question that that can get asked very very important question actually that that sometimes uh, tends to get us here from a performance optimization standpoint and query folding basically leads to the fact that the kind of operations that you can perform at the source get transferred to the source okay so at at a very basic level you can see that there's something called view native query there will be something called view native query that you will see so if i just quickly go ahead and and, and get some data from sql server here real quick I'll, I'll try to pull in some data from sql server i think this is also the first time that you are seeing how i me connect to a sql server so i give a dot as my server name and i'll try to connect on to my local instance i have a, I have a database called adventure works as a demo so i'll connect to my adventure works database and here i'll go ahead and connect to let's say dim customer 
or let me go back and connect to team product connect to team product click on okay and there goes my sql server table and if i try to add in some columns here let's say what i'll do is i'll try to remove all this stuff okay try to remove all the stuff that i have here remove columns obviously these are things that that's going to work as expected just like as we understand steps are going to be created i can go back and remove all this stuff from here okay i don't need this so i've kept only three columns and what i can do here is further thing i can actually add columns whatever you know the idea here is to show you something called view native query and what happens here is that i've actually got data into power bi desktop now okay you remember i connected to my sql server i got data into power bi desktop and after that whatever transformation i performed here, i performed this within power bi desktop okay so whatever transformation i did i did it within power bi desktop but using query folding power bi will actually transfer that operation to my source so what is my source my source is my sql server so instead of performing this operation within power bi that is instead of performing this in memory inside power bi i will be performing this in database okay so you're transferring in memory operation to an in database operation now that stuff will be performed in your database that is in your sql server and the resultant will be returned so if you just go to right click on that and go to view native query you can see that this is the resultant stuff that will be returned from my underlying table from my database okay it's a very powerful feature and what it means is that when you're actually getting the data into power bi you're not going to get all those 50 columns right if you need only three columns then power bi will bring in only those three columns and actually as i said it's a very very powerful feature and it not only works with removing columns you can actually go back and remove columns and you can see that at this layer also if you go to view native query it actually gets renamed as alias gets applied okay so let me give give some different name here like color name let's say english product name i'm going to call it let's just going to call it product name okay and here i'm going to call it product id so i've actually renamed all my columns here and as we understand in, in as part of the sql language when you rename a column you all you're doing is you're actually applying an alias and again as you can see although this step i'm performing within power bi desktop you know uh, power bi desktop will just go back and offload that operation or transfer that operation back to the source which is the sql server and if you go to view native query you can actually check that okay and again it's a very very important piece uh, that you should keep in mind uh, if you try to do a split here let's say i'll try to do a split here split by delimiter okay and let's say i want to split this by a space and click on okay and see how i split that stuff and if i right click on this now you will see that view native query is disabled because in the native sql language in native sql server this operation is not supported so up to a certain point you can do query folding but beyond a certain point you can't do query folding that is another important thing to keep in mind so if you perform any transformation in query editor you know for which query folding is not possible obviously view native query would be grayed out in that case I mean, obviously, that means that at the native database layer, that particular operation is not supported. So that's another important thing to keep in mind. Okay, what are some of the common transformations? Another very, very important uh, question that might get asked at times because just to test your basic level of knowledge, uh, changing data types, very fundamental thing. Will you'll do it always, all the time? You know, another thing that I will add is adding, you know, header rows. You want to basically modify your header rows, filtering rows. Another very useful thing. You know, typically, if you're connecting to Excel data or some kind of CSV sources. You know, initial few rows might just be, you know, gibberish. It might just have merge cells, some kind of image, some kind of introduction, headers, all those stuff. And you'll always want to filter out rows initially. Columns, such an important thing. You don't want to see all those columns, right? If you have 50 columns, you don't really care about. Just take out three or four columns out of it. Very important option. Grouping, aggregations, again, very important. Splitting, another very common kind of transformation that you might want to use. Okay, uh, some T limiter, some characters based on which you want to split the columns out, subset something out. So very very important option over adding new columns needless to say it's something that you do all the time right can sql and power query be used together i think i just answered this question in this example here answer is absolutely yes you can and the best part is you don't have to uh, you know obviously you can do it in the graphical user interface or you can directly go ahead and type out your query you can straight away type out your sql query here more customized sql query across multiple tables what are query parameters uh, query parameters are on, again a very very important topic in power bi and query parameters the whole idea is that they are very similar to filters, but they are a more dynamic sort of filters. And, and the way you set them is using the parameters wizard here. I will go back to my orders uh, query right now. Go to manage parameters and set up a new parameter called region. So I can actually define a parameter like this. It's a region parameter. Type is going to be text type. Okay. Suggested so values is going to be, let's say, I'm going to give a list of values. And when you say any, basically, you get a uh, you get a text box. And if you give a list of values, you get a drop down. That's the only difference. I'll show you both the examples. Okay. Current value is a default that you can give. Actually, I'll, I'll go back and put it as central. Right. So as my region parameter, I've set up here. And now what I can do is I can go to my orders table and see how I can filter by region here. In the query, editor, I can go here. I can filter by region. I can directly type out a value here. Instead of doing this, what I can do is I can go to text filters. I can say equals. 
and here I can go back and select the specific parameter type okay and this is really the amazing thing about parameters so now instead of saying equals to a particular region instead of typing out a value here I can go back and say it is equal to that parameter region okay so now that filter is actually equal to that parameter region okay and what is that parameter region equal to remember that parameter region equal to was set a central so now that central parameter is set to central and that is why it is filtered on central okay if you go to the region it is seen as filtered on central right now and it's very easy to change it by the way go to edit parameters go to edit here and see that text box comes up because the list type was any it is actually set as a text box and actually go back and set it to something else let's say east and now we can see it's automatically going to change it to east okay that's the real uh, beauty of using parameters generally you just have to go back and click on that interface once to for it to reflect just to refresh it once for it to reflect and now you can see it's reflecting as east if you go back and set this as west let's say if you go back and set this as west and if i go back to orders now you should be able to see that now the entire thing is automatically filtered to west so you can see how dynamic the whole thing is and remember this is not only at the query editor level even the visualization layer you know when you're using parameters when you've actually loaded this query in you can, you can straight away go to edit edit parameters so something very similar to what we are seeing here you will see in the visualization layer also you will see in the modeling tab sorry here you will see the edit parameter section coming up here where you can go back and directly modify your parameters straight away from the visuals itself and and one other important thing is uh, the other use case where this is actually required and the question that we're asking here here is power bi templates the other other thing that you should all mention where what is the use case of this as i mentioned the use case of this is one very common use case of this is you, you don't want to load all your data right so if you have data for all the four different regions central east west and south you don't want to load all your data right you can have hundreds and thousands of rows of data but you don't really care about all your data right if you want to look at data only for west then you want to select west you, you want to see data only for east you want to select only east right but what you don't want to do is you don't want to select all your data you want to get all your data into power bi desktop and then you want to filter it okay there are two options right one option is to include all your data load all your data and then put a filter the other option is first you give the user a prompt and based on whatever option they select in the prompt you go back and load your data and and, and the second option is obviously the parameter approach which is preferred any day because you're you're loading in only the requisite amount of data that you require you're not loading in any additional data and the best part about the second approach is again as i said you're loading in only the amount of data that's required so obviously the amount of data that you're loading in is very very less and obviously the performance will be much better so another common use case is with dates right so if you have data worth the, for the last 10 years and you don't care about that 10 years data right so you care about only data for the last one month so you always give people a filter option or in this case when i say filters i mean parameters right so you configure filters with parameters and now get people get a prompt when they, when they open up the dashboard they get a prompt and when they want to view the dashboard they can actually have to select the date they'll have to go to the prompt select the date and now depending on what they enter data will be filtered and from the source only that data for the last three months will be picked up okay so that's the use case of parameters and and how parameters are different from the normal standard on filters which language is in power query we talked about it already m code and it's very important to also mention a bit of background when you ask this question just talk a little bit about the background of what is power query why do we need power query I and mean, power pivot can import data from mostly sources and i think this also has been answered before i have talked about this as well previously but it's also important when you get this question to give some context on what is power query and what is power pivot and essentially mention the part that although yes you can get data in power pivot but it's also very very important that you address the part that it is power query that is an etl tool okay power pivot is not an etl tool power pivot is only used for loading data into the model that's it i mean essentially power pivot can only be used for performing calculations and analysis okay the whole point of power pivot is analytics okay it is not for data cleansing okay if you want to perform data cleansing that is not power pivot's role so the sort of two add-in components the two tools have two very different roles and that is the thing that you have to bring out in this particular question power maps obviously is the mapping interface of power bi so i just got to briefly focus a bit on this particular piece obviously maps are extremely powerful in power bi desktop and if you just go to the map section one very very important thing guys you have to keep in mind is when you're configuring especially working with maps is to set the correct geographical type so if you go to modeling uh, you have data category something called data category it is very very important that you when you inherently have data like city it is very important that you go to data category and set this as a city okay extremely important that especially when you're working with map data you have to set this as geographical data type and when you do that you will see a small globe sign will come up okay so now it signifies that city is actually of a data category city which is a geographical type and a small globe sign will come i'll do the same for country as well do the same thing for country i'll do the same thing for postal code and see how postal code is actually summarized so this is this is another thing that will happen uh, from time to time in power bi 
which you have to fix in modeling. So uh, sometimes something will be summarized. So obviously postal code is something I don't want to summarize. So I'll actually go to don't summarize. Okay, because if I give you two postal codes five six zero one zero two and five six zero one zero three, you can't. I mean, this makes no sense to say the average postal code is five six zero one zero two point five. Makes no sense, right? So I'll never summarize that kind of data. Go to postal code and set it to postal code as a geographical type. See the globe side will come up, and finally the only thing that's remaining here is state. I go to state and set a type here as state. And once that is done, I will go ahead and okay. You can see that it says apply changes, and the problem here is that I've actually made some changes to my underlying query, which is something that's okay. I will not go back and load it right now. So I'll, I'll directly straight away go to the maps, and there are two kinds of maps mainly in the desktop interface. Obviously, there are a lot of custom visuals that you guys have. So just to give you a sneak peek into custom visuals real quick and we're going to spend a lot of time on that just to give you a sneak peek on this whole piece i have a lot of custom visual maps where you can do a lot of cool things but at a basic level obviously you have only the kind of maps that you're seeing here right now i'm going to quickly go ahead and close that query because i'm connected to my sql server it is creating a bit of issue okay so next step is i'm going to go ahead and quickly replicate and just kind of repeat what i just now did so i'm going to quickly go ahead and set this to city set my state to the state type set my postal code and finally i'll go ahead and set my country okay so the idea again is that i wanted to highlight here is the concept of setting geographical types correctly because this again when you when you try to visualize this data finally in maps uh, it just ensures that you're that you're more accurately able to represent data uh, remember power bi will do a pretty good job in understanding exactly what a particular thing is so if it's a city name if it's delhi bangalore mumbai power bi knows it is a city so you know you don't have to specifically tell it's a city but remember if it's something that power bi is not able to perfectly recognize in certain cases it will be very very useful because remember the column names are not always going to be exactly what you're seeing right now although it's recommended that you use proper column names but that may not be the case and again the underlying data may not be exactly what power bi is able to recognize so those kind of scenarios is very helpful if you set data categories accurately remember even if you don't set it properly power bi will still display your data properly okay but then there are certain use cases where it will not come accurately okay and i can go ahead and represent this in a map and all i have to do is just take my country i'll take my state i'll look at my city and see how power bi is not able to do it the best way all the time so sometimes it will fail and I'll, I'll represent this data based on sales so sales is basically going to be my size let's say okay, i can further do a color saturation based on sales okay i can look at this data across and now you're seeing right and and, and you might be wondering what's exactly happening why am i only seeing uh, you know western united states and the reason is because if you remember i have filters applied so so the underlying model that i've taken I have filters applied based on parameters okay and again that is something i can further configure within power bi okay just to quickly clarify this once again where do you set the edit parameters remember parameters is something i applied just a while back and you can further look at the visualization layer you can further go to edit queries go to edit parameters and you don't have to open edit queries just go back here and set it as east or west or central whatever you want to set this is east now click on okay and you will see now this whole thing will automatically go ahead and convert to east Okay, you have to apply the changes because remember we're actually doing as a query level change. So idea is that when you when you set this as east, it will go back to the query, it will take all your data, it will take your eastern data, and now it will show you only the eastern data. Okay, so that's the that's the idea now. Now it will see it's only showing you eastern data. You can further go to edit queries. Now you're going to see the central data. I just just type in central here, and now you're going to see only central data. Okay, so apply changes for the filter to actually go back to the source and get only the relevant central data. And this is the part where I mentioned that at every point in time you're prompting the user and again It's a very very good performance optimization technique that you can use especially when you're dealing with very very large data sets Okay, a few of these things I've already talked about these are a few additional questions that we have power view power bi designer Can we refresh our reports power bi reports? Uh, this is an important question again. Uh, this is related to scheduled refresh Scenarios are you will want to refresh your data, right? You will want to typically have a schedule and when you're when you're publishing your data on the cloud or a data set section basically have an option for schedule refresh and this is exactly where you can go ahead and set up your refreshes specifically for uh, the kind of data that you have and you need something called a gateway uh, right now my gateway is not configured but you need something called a gateway to set up a schedule refresh remember if you are connecting to an on-premise source especially a sql server database or something like that on-premise source then you need to have a gateway and you can actually download your gateway from here to configure it further Right, and you can also go to the manage gateways tab to basically go and manage your gateways. So if you already have a gateway installed and you want to go back and set your gateway specifically, so this is one other place where you can go back and and check your gateway. Everything's working fine there. 
Okay, so it's important that you mention a couple of these things that obviously yes, you can refresh There is something called schedule refresh and also mention about gateways gateways are that uh, they are the interface between the cloud and the on-premise world Okay, so gateways are what allows you to transfer your data from on-premise sources to your Azure cloud where your cloud server that's the power service is hosted What are the different types of refreshing data package refresh model refresh tile refresh and visual container refresh? So this is another important question. So typically when we talk about refreshes, how many ways can you refresh the package refresh is basically the concept wherein let's say you have a Power BI desktop file or an Excel file which you have in the service and I mean obviously the same file is there in, in, in OneDrive or SharePoint online and you want to ensure that they are both synced essentially whatever data you have here you have there and vice versa and that is something you do using what we call package refresh. Okay, that ensures that whatever Files you have in your Power BI service is exactly in sync with what you have in the OneDrive or SharePoint online Remember it is not going to pull data from your source. It's not like the typical kind of refresh that you're thinking So that is basically going to be the model or data refresh So so the refresh that you are thinking or the refresh that I showed you here is basically the model or data refresh Okay, this is basically what we call the model or data refresh Okay, that is what you do using refresh now or schedule refresh Okay then we have something called tile refresh, which is something that we we can go to the different dashboards and as we all understand in dashboards whatever stuff that you see remember th these are just views of the underlying reports. Okay, and you can just click on the tiles and it will take you to the underlying report. So dashboards are nothing but cache sheet views of the underlying reports which typically get refreshed every 15 minutes or so. Okay, but if you want to specifically refresh a tile you can go back and say refresh dashboard tiles. Okay, that is how you refresh the dashboard views to reflect according to the data changes which anyways get refreshed every 15 minutes. Okay, those are the types of views uh, refreshes that you have is is available on premises answer is absolutely yes And when you answer this question is also very very important for you to specifically mention about the gateways And also to talk a little bit about the kinds of sources that you can connect to okay Remember for power bi to connect to cloud sources. It doesn't need a gateway So if you have something living on azure if you have something living on an online service uh, you do not need a gateway if you have something living in sharepoint online or uh, OneDrive, you do not need a gateway. Okay, so even if you want to perform a schedule refresh, you don't need a gateway. So gateways are only required if you want to connect onto uh, on-premise source, either to perform a schedule refresh or to get data directly from a direct query. Okay, which is nothing but a live connection essentially. What is Power BI Q&A? And uh, Power BI Q&A, as I briefly showed you sometime in you know, initially in the discussion, was it's it's a natural language querying tool. So you can just type in queries. And essentially it just gives you results on the fly. It's not that intelligent right now Bob. It's remember it's still a very very preview feature it's a, it's, it's a feature under constant development, but it's fairly accurate It's pretty good overall and there's a lot of artificial intelligence built in overall there in, in how the tool performs Especially in the app and I don't know if you guys have used the just do take some time It may not be an interview question obviously, but uh, take some time out to explore this on the power bi app and in power bi app What they call they rolled out a feature called conversational Q&A. Okay, so here is a standard Q&A but if you use the app, they have something called conversational Q&A, where it is just like as if you're having conversation with Google Assistant or Siri, something like that. You know, it's just like you're having a conversation, asking them, hey, what is the sales, and they'll go back and respond something, and then you can just go back and carry on the conversation from there. You don't have to type in a new question every time. Okay, you can just carry on the conversation, just like having a conversation with a friend. It's a pretty cool feature overall, and uh, remember this power, this feature is there as a in in the service, but it is there in the desktop as a preview feature. Which is something you should also mention. Okay, so uh, what are the ways Excel experience can be leveraged with Power BI? And uh, there are a couple of things that we can do in Excel, by the way, which I wanted to briefly talk about. And uh, just to discuss about this piece, what I want to do is I just go quickly open up Excel. So there are two things particularly that you have in Excel. So one thing we, we call the Power BI publisher for Excel. Obviously, uh, the personal gateway and the on premise gateway, the gateways that we have. But there's one additional component that is worth mentioning called Analyze in Excel updates. As you can see, there's something called Analyze in Excel update. So these are both add-ins that you have to install in Excel. So Analyze in Excel allows you to go back and analyze a data set in Power BI from within Excel. Okay, so if you have a data set in Power BI service, just go ahead, click on it. Okay, you can click on it and you can basically just say Analyze in Excel. And when you do that, basically you download a file, you download an ODC file. ODC file basically stands for Office Data Connection file. Just going to show you what that Office Data Connection file is and how it looks like. So this is what an ODC file looks like. Okay, if you guys see my screen right now, you will see that it's an office data connection file. Okay, it's an ODC file. Right click, go to properties, you will see it's an ODC file. Okay, and now what I can do is I can directly just double click on it and it will open up within Excel and it will straight away open up in the Power Pivot interface. 
Okay, what I did was I, I took data from the data sets in Power BI service and I'm now I'm analyzing that straight away with an Excel and see how it opens up. Okay, that's my orders table and see how it comes up now. Remember in my original service also I had only the orders table. Okay, so now I'm looking at the same orders table and I'm analyzing that table within my familiar pivot table interface. Okay, fine. So this is a great feature that we have in the Power BI. The overall interaction and, and overall the interaction that you have between Excel and Power BI is just uh, phenomenal generally. Okay, and a lot of these things tend to be included. A lot of these things are happening where there is more interactivity that's been built in, but the overall concept is that the integration has to be seamless between both the environments, right? So you can very clearly take data from service from the Power BI to Excel and Excel to Power BI and vice versa. So that's that's the seamless integration that that exists right now between these two tools. So, so right now we have learned how you can get something from the service onto the Excel. But the other way around from Excel to the service essentially from Excel to Power BI. How do you do that? And for that you need something called Power BI publisher for Excel, which I have already ad added as an add-in. And remember again for this you need to go ahead and sign in to your service and I can just go ahead and hit a publish now and all I have to do is I can just pin it. Just the usual way I can pin to my dashboard. Just a very simple example AAA. I go ahead and pin to my existing dashboard and you can see it's published. It's pinned to my dashboard now and if I go back to the service and if I take a look at my demo, I can see that that a is now pinned and you can see how how seamless integration is and how these two environments power bi and excel are talking to each other okay so it's very very important that you mention some of these use cases as examples and if you can do that if you can highlight some of these things it will be really appreciated than just giving a theoretical answer so give some of these examples and use cases and what okay these are the excel bi add-ins i spent a lot of time discussing this so uh, do mention some 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 a, a very very brief about all these different tools that you have how is data security implemented in Power BI? This is actually a very, very important question, uh, especially if it pertains to role level security, RLS as we call it. Okay. And the way you do that in Power BI is using the concept for roles. Okay. So you first do this in the desktop. So, for instance, right now here you can see I have data. Uh, one of the first things I'll do probably here is remove that parameter. Okay. I'll go ahead and remove that parameter. Okay. It's being referenced by the query, so I can't remove obviously. So, I'll just go back and first go ahead and Quickly remove that filter and now go back and remove that parameter. Okay, and close and apply. So, what I'm looking at right now is obviously the entire United States data because I have no filters applied. So, everything's perfect. I can go to manage roles, and the way I do this is using something called manage roles. Okay, so if you go to the modeling tab, you see something called manage roles in security. Go to manage roles, and here you will have an option to set roles. Okay, so what I will do is I will want to create separate roles for separate people, right? So let's say it's a big company that I have as I operate and uh, you know, I have different people from different regions. I have central people. I have eastern region people. I have western region people. So central region people should not be able to look at data for eastern region people, right? If, 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 if you belong to a central region, if you're a manager for central region, you don't care about eastern region or western region, right? So it's probably confidential data or, or whatever the use case, but you only want to focus on data which is central. So what I will do is in that case, I will basically create roles. I will create what I call a central role. And I will create what I call a Eastern role. And as the next step, what I need to do is I need to go back and write some basic tax. And what I will do is I'll go ahead and type in my quick expression. I'm going to say region is equal to central. And remember, this is the role I'm setting for central role. The tax filter expression. This is always going to be a filter expression, and the result always has to be a true or false, right? So this is going to be a region equal to central. And for the remaining, I'm just going to go back and hit save. And for Eastern, I'm going to put it as region is equal to Eastern. Okay, so see how I set up two different roles here. One is for the central role. So any, if anyone is viewing it from the central region, you know, they, they, this particular filter will be applied by default. And if anyone is viewing it from the Eastern region, this particular filter will be applied by default. Okay, click on save. And now the DAX role has been configured. Okay, one way you can preview this feature is by clicking on view role as okay. And a good way to do this is just to go back and put some additional information. Let's say I'll have a region here. And have region wise sales and profits mentioned here just to give some clarity on the exact data that you're seeing. And now, if I go back and click on view roles as or view as roles, this is the way you can preview your stuff. Okay, that how the central people will view this, they're looking at only central data, and how the eastern people will view this. Now they're looking at only eastern data. Okay, so this is how you can go and see that stop viewing as option will come up. You're actually viewing it as the role of east role. So, as a developer, you can preview exactly what people will see when they see your dashboard. Okay, so it's a very very important feature. 
now all this is good so all that we have done right now is we have implemented this in the desktop how do we publish this out so obviously uh, we already understand publishing so all that we have to do is obviously we have to go to and save it first and i'm going to go ahead and publish this out save it in my demo file so remember to obviously to implement this in the service you have to publish it first so right now i've just implemented my desktop so the final step is i have to publish it so i will publish to my workspace so replace because there exists another data set with the same name is already there so it will by default replace because they both are the same names right and once i do that go back to my service now and you can go to data sets now you can go to manage security there's a security section here and here you should be able to add you should see the roles present here okay this is where you can basically now go back and add the email addresses of all the people and remember this further will be linked to your ad groups right because remember you have configured it depends on the admin settings how you have set it and all that but uh, basically you can type email addresses of all those people who are belonging to the east role and email addresses of all the people who are belonging to the central role now if anyone who is in the eastern role and if they try to view your dashboard now they will basically be looking at only eastern data because i've said that filter remember region is equal to east and if anyone who is belonging to the central role is trying to view your dashboard they will look at only central data okay and that depends on what email addresses you enter here okay so as an administrator you can basically go ahead and enter all this stuff and that is how you at a very very simple layer you can implement role level security remember i've done it at a very simplistic level but this could be a far more complex tax expression so you can come back here uh, you could probably go back and write a far more complex tax expression the idea is that it has to be a bull in by as the end product power bi does support mobile so there is a power bi mobile app which is supported across multiple platforms and many many relationships are something that's another very very important uh, point that uh, it, it tends to gust gets asked a lot so does it support many to many relationships answer is actually no uh, it only supports one to one one to many and many to one but many to many if you have to implement you have to implement using what we call bridge table okay so that is something you have to specifically replicate or create either in the model or in the power query so first create that bridge table a one to many to many to one a very good example could be authors and books one author can write many books one book can be written by many authors or doctors and patients also a very good example you know one doctor can uh, has treated multiple patients and one patient has been treated by multiple doctors in both these cases you have to create a bridge table okay and then you will set up the one to many relationships in power bi desktop that is how we will typically implement this power bi publish for excel we have talked about this already the differences we have briefly talked about edit interactions typically work at the uh, the visual layer of power bi uh, another very very important component especially in the visualization stack is edit interactions so here this is my it's a very simple bar chart i have i can parallelly build a line chart here and now my line chart is going to be showing my sales based on audit date let's say okay very simple line chart i have here so the idea of edit interaction says you want to specifically choose how you want these two to interact with each other okay so i can further have that map okay so i'm going to take that map i'm going to copy paste it across here okay so now i have three different visuals on the same page and i'm going to try to set up an interactivity between each one of them okay just going to try to align them a bit and the way to do that is using edit interactions okay go to format go to edit interactions and that's how you turn on the interactions panel and as you can see when i click on the map how are the others interacting okay so you can see the very clearly the line is being filtered whereas the bar is being highlighted what does it mean it means that when i click on a particular value here so if i want to know more about california or san francisco click on san francisco and everything else is filtered on san francisco okay if i want to know more about let's say colorado uh, city of little town and colorado click on little town and now you see everything about little town and colorado want to know more about new jersey lakewood click on lakewood and you see more about lakewood and see how this particular line chart is filtered whereas this is actually highlighted if you want to turn on the filter for this go to edit and make it a filter and now it is actually filtered and not highlighted okay if you want to turn this as none you can turn this as none so with respect of whatever you select here so you can see the line is not being impacted okay and that is how you basically turn on interactions and specify interaction between different visuals in power bi desktop and finally how does ssrs integrate with power bi and this is again something that you guys should mention especially when you're asked a question on components so you will anyway discuss about the microsoft bi stack and generally you talk about talk a little bit traditional bi and separately if you ask the question you know does it integrate answer is absolutely yes uh, just the same way i showed you how excel and power bi integrate so seamlessly the same thing applies with ssrs as well in ssrs and power bi they seem interact very very seamlessly okay you can build ssrs dashboards and you can very easily pin them into power bi the same way i pinned an excel stuff into power bi okay so same thing happens in ssrs as well
okay so indeed there is a very very rich interaction that happens between both so before we end the session let's just take a simple look at how power bi is performing in today's market because it's always important to understand the market for a technology before you completely dive into it now in terms of job vacancies power bi is something that is going rapidly now the rate of growth is somewhere about 3% every month at the current scenario but again is something that is going to increase more because how effective power bi has become in today's market how easy it is for anyone to use power bi is going to bring in a lot more opportunities so it's always helpful if you move into this field the beginning itself and that we have a lot more experience when it becomes a popular technology so apart from that when you look at the salary average it's somewhere about 50000 pounds for a 3 month okay the 3 month tenure is what this graph is representing so this basically is a huge amount but then again i would not tell that this would be less because power bi is something that is used by people from different domains this could be a corporate business head everyone today is comfortable using power bi because it is a self service business intelligence tool it can be used by people who have some technical knowledge and also can be used by people who have no technical knowledge as well so it caters to the need of multiple people with respect to their needs okay so with this we come to a conclusion of today's session hope you had a great session thank you and goodbye i hope you have enjoyed listening to this video please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to edureka channel to learn more happy learning